Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to The Show Must Go Online, bringing you live performed readings of Shakespeare's complete plays with a global cast every Wednesday. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of The Shakespeare Deck. Tonight's Henry IV, part two, will start in approximately 15 minutes time. Fantastic news to share with our regular viewers this week. We've now passed a milestone, or in fact, two key milestones on Patreon, with 150 50 patrons now donating over £1,000 a month. Thank you all so much for this. As you know, we have worked with over 300 actors to date, and many of them have chosen to opt in to our hardship fund as a result of losing work due, due to COVID-19. So these donations really do make a world of difference. Thank you so much. Sarah also has an exciting preview of new exclusive content to share with you this evening. Uh, if you'd like to donate, you can find a link in the YouTube description. I'm also very proud to be able to tell you that The Show Must Go Online has received a second Oncom Award from Off West End for Richard III, our first ever alumni show and a milestone in the show's history. Congratulations to all those who took part in that incredible show. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and set the bell icon to receive all notifications to make sure that you always receive updates from us. And remember to follow us at T. SMG Online Live on Twitter or at The Show Must Go Online on Insta and Facebook. And now to introduce the play this evening, brought to us as always by the majestic Ben Crystal, is Jeremy Mortimer, a friend of the show and responsible for many of the fantastic text edits that we've used. Jeremy is a freelance director and radio producer. He worked for many years in BBC Radio Drama, where he produced hundreds of plays, including a number of radio adaptations of Shakespeare plays. Jeremy, the play is Henry the Fourth, Part Two, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. And thank you for giving me the chance to talk about one of my favorite plays, the often overlooked second part to Henry the Fourth. And thanks too to Rob and Sarah and the whole company for letting this play peek out from under the shadows of its older sibling, Part One, and its wacky cousin, The Merry Wives of Windsor. When texts are edited to present Henry IV as a single play, it's always the second part that gets squeezed and filleted, sometimes being reduced to a couple of scenes and a conclusion. And the accepted view of critics and audiences is that it lacks part one's exuberantly festive spirit. But I think to see it in that way is to miss the point and to be blind to the fact that with this play, Shakespeare is doing something radical. He is turning the history play on its head. Back in 2012, I made a series called My Own Shakespeare for BBC Radio. Not my Shakespeare, I hasten to add, but the favourite scenes chosen by a whole range of public figures in UK cultural and political life. Lots of people chose the classic speeches and scenes from the Premier League plays, but Sir Nicholas Heitner, then director of the National Theatre in London, chose Act 3, Scene 2 of Henry IV, Part 2 an apparently modest little scene in which Sir John Falstaff and his friend Robert Shallow muse over some of the people they knew in their youth. More of that later. But first, what do you need to know about English history or Shakespeare before you can enjoy this play? Don't worry, you don't need to know any dates. But let me take you back for a moment, not to part one, but to Richard II. For it is in that play that Henry Bolingbroke returns from exile, gathers an army, and deposes his cousin, Richard II, to take the throne as King Henry IV. This action, and Henry's unwitting but generally acquiescent part in Richard's subsequent murder, is the seed for the rebellion that grows in the land, and the guilt that gnaws away at Henry through the two plays that follow. Look out for his stunning insomnia speech at the start of Act Three. Back in Richard II, we hear from Henry that his unthrifty son, a young wanton, wastes his time with a dissolute crew in the taverns of Eastcheap. And sure enough, in the first part of Henry IV, we dive into the boar's head and revel with young Hal, the Prince of Wales, with Bardolph Poins and the inimitable Sir John Falstaff as they plan the robbery at Gad's Hill. Part one ends with Hal redeeming his reputation temporarily in action against the rebels at the Battle of Shrewsbury, where he saves his father's life and kills that hot-headed man of action, Hotspur, although Falstaff claims the prize. So we might expect part two to pick up where part one leaves off with Harry, 
as he is generally referred to in this play, the shift from Hal in the first part, safely back in his father's good books and the rebels on the run and everything progressing as expected towards the inevitable death of the sick king and Harry stepping into the big role. Well, those of you who have been watching the HBO series Succession will know that where there are big egos in the room, things are never so simple. The Prince of Wales, or Kendall Roy if you are a Succession fan, slips back into the taverns of East Cheap, leaving his father to complain about his behaviour to his more reliable sons, John, Thomas and Clarence. But first, and the Roy's media empire in Succession is a great exponent of this, Shakespeare introduces us to the allegorical figure of rumour. Yes, fake news itself, whose job it is to stuff the ears of men with false reports. Rumour, who enters the stage in a costume painted with tongues, is spreading the news that it was Harry Monmouth, aka the Prince of Wales, who fell at Shrewsbury under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword. And it is this news that reaches Hotspur's father, Northumberland, holed up in his castle and feigning illness. When Northumberland learns the truth and has to face up to the fact that his cowardly absence from the battle may have contributed to his son's death, it suddenly seems that Shakespeare is giving us a revenge tragedy with the Percy family at its core. But no, the scene switches to East Cheap and we are reunited with Sir John and the Lord Chief Justice, who we learn has previous with the Prince of Wales, who had given him a box on the ears many years ago as a result of some altercation involving the mate Bardolph. We don't meet Harry until Act Two, and the King doesn't appear until Act Three. So what kind of a history play is this? There's a clue in a line from Warwick. There is a history in all men's lives. And as the East Cheap and Gloucestershire scenes with their extraordinary array of ordinary characters intercuts with scenes in which the rebel leaders make their plots, and King Henry and his less dissolute sons work out how to trick them into submission, it becomes clear that Shakespeare is doing something revolutionary. Rather than follow the chronicles of kings and nobles, he is broadening his scope to include the experiences and memories of all of the characters, essentially democratizing the notion of history by bringing center stage a social and domestic realism which had hitherto too, only appeared sporadically in drama. Listen out for Mistress Quickly's detailed account of how, many years previously, upon a Wednesday in Whitson Week, Sir John sat in her dolphin chamber at the round table by the sea coal fire and proposed to her before getting her to lend him 30 shillings. This is an intimate personal history that feels as fresh today as the day it was first spoken on the stage of the theatre in Shoreditch some 420 plus years ago. Rather than looking at, at, at it as a history play, it might be better to consider these plays in the tradition of the medieval mystery plays treatment of the prodigal son story, or the Christmas entertainments with the Lord of Misrule. But with the distinction in Harry's case that the prodigal role is something that he has deliberately assumed, explaining as he does in part one that his wastrel reputation is politic, because when he throws off his loose behaviour and reforms, he will shine even brighter than before. And as the Falstaff, he is the spirit of carnival. And as such, his role is to make us collude in the incitement to riot. But if we are to collude willingly, we do so because we are swept up by the fertility and quickness of his wit. And unlike the two-dimensional figure from the Saturnalia, Falstaff reveals a rueful self-awareness, an acknowledgement of vulnerability an overriding melancholy that speaks of humanity. At times, he even exercises a kind of topsy-turvy moral authority. As Emma Smith points out in her book, This is Shakespeare, there are moments when Falstaff's counter-cultural rhetoric brings to mind a 20th century icon who shares his appetites, his outspoken arrogance and plain speaking, Homer Simpson. Homer's to alcohol, the cause of, and the solution to all of life's problems is essentially a pithy rewrite of Falstaff's peon to sack. If part one is a play of opportunity with Hotspur and Hal vying to be cock of the walk, part two is about the closing down of things. It has an autumnal feel, 
The carnival cannot go on forever. At some point, social discipline must be resumed. And the sick old king will die so that the young prince can become king. We already know that there will be no place in that brave new world for Fulstar or for swaggering pistol whose blagging and bluster is full of reference to old plays. There is only the past to go back to, and that is only partly reliable. The rose-tinted world we get a glimpse of when Falstaff and Robert Shallow remember how when they were young and frequented the stews of Southwark, they lay all night in the windmill in St George's Field and heard the chimes at midnight. Nicholas Heitner remarks how old blokes still talk like this when they get together for a drink and talk about their student days. When Shakespeare wants to go straight to the heart, he writes in prose of a kind of startling contemporary simplicity. I think it is over easy to overlook, Heitner says, how much more there is in each of these plays than there is in most other plays. There's just more to get interested, amused, excited, moved by. They're just fuller of stuff. One more thing that you can all take away from this brilliant play is a fistful of splendid insults. So Rob, away you scullion, you rampallion, you fustilarian, I'll tickle your catastrophe. <laughs> Thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Jeremy. That was brilliant. You've set the stage wonderfully well for our actors who are about to join us in just a few moments' time. So, ladies and gentlemen, the show is about to begin. So, at this point, I would encourage you to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave your reactions using the hashtag... Open your ears. For which of you will stop the vent of hearing? when loud rumour speaks. Upon my tongues, continual slanders ride, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. And who but rumour, who but only I make fearful musters and prepared defence whilst the big year Swollen with some grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war and no such matter. Rumour is a pipe blown with surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, the still discordant waving multitude, can play upon it. Why is rumour? Here. I run before King Harry's victory, who, in a bloody field in Shrewsbury, hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion even with the rebel's blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword and that the king, before Douglas's rage, stooped his anointed head as low as death. This I have rumoured through the peasant towns, between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone, where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. The posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learnt from me. From rumours' tongues they bring smooth comforts, false, worse than true wrongs. Act One, Scene One. Walkworth before Northumberland's Kettle. Enter the Lord Bardolph at one door. Who keeps the gate here? Oh! Where is the Earl? What shall I say you are? Tell thou the Earl that the Lord Bardoth doth attend him here. His Lordship is walked forth into the orchard. Please it your honour, knock but at the gate, and he himself will answer. Here comes the Earl. <clears throat> what news, Lord Bardoth? Every minute now shall be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild, contention like a horse full of high feeding, madly hath broke loose and bears down all before him. Noble Earl, 
I bring you certain news from Shrewsbury. Good and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death. And in the fortune of my lord, your son, Prince Harry slain outright. And both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field. And Harry Monmouth's brawn, the hawk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Oh, such a day, so fought, so followed, and so fairly won, came not till now to dignify the time since Caesar's fortunes. How is this derived? Saw you the field? Came you from Shrewsbury? I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence, a gentleman well-bred and of good name, that freely rendered me these news for true. Here comes my servant Travers, who I sent on Tuesday last to listen after news. Now, Travers, what good tidings comes with you? My lord, Sir John Umfreville turned me back with joyful tidings, and being better horsed, outrode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman, almost forspent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his bloodied horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had bad luck, and that young Harry Percy's spur was cold. With that, he gave his able horse the head. He seemed in running to devour the way, staying no longer question. Uh, again, uh, said he young Harry Percy's spur was cold. Of hot spur, cold spur, what, what rebellion had met ill luck? My lord, I'll tell you what. If my young lord your son have not the day, upon mine honor, for a silken point I'll give my barony. Never talk of it. Why should that gentleman that rode by Travers give then such instances of loss? Who he? He was some hildling fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on, and upon my life spoke at a venture. Look, here comes more news. <clears throat> Yea, this man's brow like to a title leaf foretells the nature of a tragic volume. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord. How doth... I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fight fright our party. How doth my son and brother? Thou tremblest and the whiteness of thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. This thou would say, your son did thus and thus, your brother thus, so fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds, but in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise, ending with brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living, and your brother yet, but for my lord, your son, why, he is dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes that what he feared is chanced. Yet speak, Morton. Tell thou an earl his divination lies, and I will take it as a sweet disgrace and make thee rich for doing me such wrong. You are too great to be by me gainsaid. Your spirit is too true. Your fear is too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy's dead. I see a strange confession in thine eye. Thou shakest thy head and holdst it fear or sin to speak a truth if he be slain, say so. I am sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in a bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed, to Harry Monmouth, whose swift, swift wrath beat down the ever-daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up than did our men, heavy in hot spurs lost, fry, fly from the field. Then was that noble Worcester too soon tamed prisoner, and that furious Scot, the bloody Douglas, whose well-labouring sword hath three times slayed the appearance of the king, gan veil his stomach and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs and in his flight stumbling in fear hath won the sum of all is that the king hath won and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you my lord under the conduct of young lancaster and westmoreland this is the news at full for this 
I shall have time enough to mourn. In poison, there is physic, and uh, these news, having been well, would have made me sick, but being sick have in some measure made me well. Now bind my brows with iron and approach the raggedest hour that time and spite dare bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland, and let one spirit of the firstborn cane reign in all bosoms that each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude scene may end and darkness be the barrier of the dead. Sweet Earl, divorce not wisdom from your honor. The lives of your all loving compasses lean on your health, the which if you give o'er to stormy passion must perforce decay. It was your pre-surmise your son might drop. You knew he walked o'er perils on an edge, more likely to fall than to get o'er. You were advised his, sweat, his flesh was capable of wounds and scars and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger rang. Yet did you say go forth? And none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff-born action. What hath then befallen? More than being which was like to be. We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas, that if we wrought out life, t'was ten to one. And yet we ventured for the gain proposed, choked by the respect of likely peril feared. And since we are o'erset, venture again. Come, we will all put forth body and goods. Tis more than time, and, my most noble lord, I hear for certain and dare speak for truth. The gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who, with a double surety, binds his followers, supposed sincere and holy in his thought. He's followed both with body and with mind, and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard, scraped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause, tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land, gasping for life under great Bolingbroke, and more and less do flock to follow him. Go in with me, and counsel every man the aptest way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters, and make friends with speed. Never so few, and never yet more need. Exeunt. Act One, Scene Two. London, a street. Enter John Falstaff alone, with his page following behind, bearing his sword and buckler. Sarah, you giant! What says the doctor to my water? He said, sir, the water itself was good, healthy water, but for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. Men of all sorts take a pride to gird at me. The brain of this foolish, compounded clay man is not able to invent anything that tends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. If the prince put thee into my service for any other reason than to set me off, why then I have no judgment. Oh, what said Master Donaldson about the satin for my short cloak and my slops? He said, sir, you should procure him a better assurance than Bardolph. He would not take his bond, and yours, he liked not the security. Don't let him be damned like the glutton! Pray God his tongue be hotter, a rascally, yea, forsooth, knave, to bear a gentleman in hand and then stand upon security. I had as leaf they would put rat's bane in my mouth as offer to stop it with security. Where's Bardolph? He's gone to Smithfield to, to buy your worship a horse. <laughs> I bought him in Paul's, and he'll buy me a horse in Smithfield. Hmm. And I could get me with a wife in the stews, I were manned, horsed, and wived. Uh, sir, here comes the nobleman that committed the prince for striking him about Bardolph. Uh, wait close. I will not see him. Was he that goes there? All oh, staff, and to please your lordship. He that was in question for the robbery. 
he, my lord, but he hath since done good service at Shrewsbury, and, as I hear, is now going with some charge to the Lord John of Lancaster. What? To your... Call him back again. Sir so John Falstaff. <clears throat> Boy, uh, tell him I am deaf. Uh, you must speak louder. My master is deaf. I'm sure he is. Uh, to the hearing of anything good. Go plug him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Sir John. What? Oh, a young name and begging. Is there not wars? Is there not employment? Hats about. Sir John. A word with you. My good lord, God give you lordship, good time of day. I am glad to see your lordship abroad. I heard say your lordship was sick. I hope your lordship goes abroad by advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, have yet some smack of age in you. And I most humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverend care of your health. Sir John, I sent for you before your expedition to Shrewsbury. And please your lordship, I hear his majesty is returned with some discomfort from Wales. I talk not of his majesty. You would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness has fallen into the same horse and apoplexy. Well, God mend him. I pray you, let me speak with you. This apoplexy, as I take it, is a kind of lethargy. It had its original from much grief, from study and perturbation of the brain. It is a kind of deafness. I think you are fallen into the disease, for you hear not what I say to you. Oh, very well, my lord, very well. Rather, and please you, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking that I am troubled with all. I sent for you when there were matters against for you for your life to come speak with me. Uh, I, as I was then advised by my learned counsel in the laws of this land service, I did not come. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. Uh, he that buckles himself in my belt cannot live in less. <laughs> your means are very slender and your waste is great. Yeah, I would it were otherwise. I would my means were greater and my waist slenderer. You have misled the youthful prince. Ah, uh, the young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly and he my dog. Well, I'm loath to gull a new healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury has a little gilded over your night's exploit on God's hill. You may thank the unquiet time for your quiet your spot in the action. My lord? But since all is well, keep it so. Wake not the sleeping wolf. To wake a wolf is as bad as to smell a fox. <laughs> there is not a white hair in your face, but should have his effect of gravity. Oh, his effect of gravy, gravy, gravy. You follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. Not so, my lord. Your ill angel is light, but I hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. You that are old, consider not the capacities of us that are young. You do measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your gulls, and we that are in the vanguard of our youth, I must confess, are wags too. Do you set down your name in the scroll of youth that are written down old with all the characters of age? Is not your voice broken, uh, your wind short, your chin dour, your wit single, and every part about you blasted with antiquity? And will you, you yet call yourself young? Why? Why? Why, Sir John? My lord, for my voice, I have lost it with hallowing and singing of anthems. <laughs> to approve my youth further, I will not. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding. 
for the box of the ear that the prince gave you, he gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I have checked him for it, and the young lion repents. Marry, not in ashes and sackcloth, but in new silk and old sack. Well, God send the prince a better companion. God send the companion a better prince. I cannot rid my hands of him. Well, the king has saved you. I hear you are going with John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Oh, but look, you pray that our armies join not in a hot day. I take but two shirts out with me, and I mean not to sweat extraordinarily. There is not a dangerous action can peep out his head, but I am thrust upon it. Well, I cannot last forever. But it was always yet the trick of our English nation, if they have a good thing, to make it too common. Oh, if ye will need say, I am an old man, you should give me rest. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. I were better to be eaten to death with a rust than to be scoured to nothing with perpetual motion. Ah, be honest, be honest, and God bless your expedition. Will your lordship lend me a thousand pounds to furnish me forth? Not a penny. Not a penny, you are too impatient to bear crosses. Fare you well. Command me, my cousin, Westmoreland. Yes, goodbye. Goodbye. Oi! Sir? What money is in my purse? Uh, seven groats and tuppence. I can get no remedy against this consumption of the purse. A borrowing only lingers and lingers it out, but the disease is incurable. Go, uh, bear this letter to my Lord of Lancaster. Uh, this to the Prince, uh, this to the Earl of Westmoreland, and uh, this to old Mistress Ursula, whom I have weakly sworn to marry since I perceived the first white hair on my chin. Uh, about it, you know where to find me. Oh, oh a pox of this gout, or oh, a gout of this pox, for the one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe. Well, tis no matter. If I do halt, I have the wars for my colour, and the pension ugh, shall seem the more reasonable. A good wit will make use of anything. I will turn diseases to commodity. Exit. Act One, Scene Three. York, a room in the Archbishop's Palace. Enter the Archbishop of York, Thomas Mowbray, Earl Marshal, the Lord Hastings, and Lord Bardolph. Thus have you heard our cause, and know our means. And my most noble friends, I pray you all, speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. And first, Lord Marshal, what say you to it? I will allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves upon the power and puissance of the king. Our present musters grow upon the file to five and twenty thousand men of choice, and our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with an insensed fire of injuries. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus, whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland. With him we may. Hey, Mary, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand. For in a theme so bloody faced as this, conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids uncertain should not be admitted. It's very true, Lord Bardolph, for indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. It was, my lord. 
who lined himself with hope. And so with great imagination, proper to madmen, led his powers to death and winking, leapt into destruction. But by your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. Yes, if this present quality of war lives so in hope, as in an early spring we see the appearing buds, which to prove fruit, hope gives not so much warrant as despair that frost will bite them. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model, then we must rate the cost of the erection, which if we find outweighs ability, what do we then but draw anew the model in fewer offices, or at least assist to build at all? Much more in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation in the model. Consent upon a sure foundation, how able such a work to undergo to weigh against his opposite. Or else we fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of an house beyond his power to build it, who, half thorough, gives o'er, and leaves his part created cost a naked subject to the weeping clouds and waits for churlish winter's tyranny. Grant that our hopes, yet likely of fair birth, should be stillborn, and that we now possess the utmost man of expectation. I think we are so a body, strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. <laughs> what, is the king but five and twenty thousand? No more. Nay, not so much, Lord Bardolph, for his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. One power against the French, and one against Glendower. Perforce, a third must take up us. So is the unfirm king in three divided, and his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. Mm, that we should draw his strength together uh, and come against us in full puissance need not be dreaded. If he should do so, he leaves his back unarmed, the French and Welsh baying him at the heels. Never fear that. Who is it like should lead his forces hither? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland, against the Welsh himself and Harry Monmouth. Who is substituted against the French? I have no certain notice. Let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. The, the Commonwealth is sick to the occasion uh, of uh, their own choice. Their over greedy love hath suffered. Oh, thou fond many. With what applause did thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbroke before he was what thou wouldst have him be? And being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder, art so full of them that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard? And now thou wouldst eat the dead vomit up and howlest to find it. The thoughts of men accursed. Past and to come seems best. Things present worst. Shall we go and draw our number and set on? We are time subjects, and time bids be gone. Exeunt. Act two, scene one, London, a street. Enter hostess quickly of the tavern and an officer or two, Fang and Snare. Snare lagging behind. Master Fang, have you entered the action? It is entered. Where's your yeoman? Is the lusty yeoman, will he stand to it? Sirrah! Where's Snare? Oh, Lord, I, good master Snare. Snare, yeah, yeah. Snare, we must arrest Sir John Falstaff. Oh, that may cost some lives in the doing of it, but, but he will stab. He stabbed me in my own house. If I can close with him, I care not for his thrust. No, nor I neither. I'll be at your elbow. And I but fist him once, and have come but within my vice. I'm undone by his going, I warrant you. I pray you, since my exion is entered and my case so openly known to the world, let him be brought into his answer. A hundred mark is a long one for a poor lone woman to bear. And I have borne and borne and borne, and I've been fubbed off and fubbed off and fubbed off from this day to that day. That is as a shame to be thought on. There is no honesty in such a dealing unless a woman should be made an ass and a beast to bear every knave's wrong. Yonder he comes, and that arrant malmsey knows knave Bardolph with him. Do your offices, do your offices, Master Fang and Master Snare. Do me, do me, do me your offices! How now? 
Who's Mez dead? What's the matter? I arrest you at the suit of Mistress Quickly. <laughs> Away, Violet! <laughs> Draw Barlow! Cut me off the villain's head! Throw the Queen into the channel! <laughs> Throw me in the channel? <laughs> I'll throw thee in the channel. <laughs> Will thou? Will thou? <laughs> thou bastardly rogue! Murder! Murder! <laughs> oh, thou honeysuckle villain, wilt thou kill the princes and the kings? Oh, thou honeyseed rogue! Thou art a honeyseed, a man queller, and a woman queller! Keep them off, Bardolf! <laughs> Rescue! A rescue! Would people bring a rescue or two? Thou wilt not, thou wilt not. Uh, <laughs> oh, do thou, do, do, do thou rogue, do thou hemp seed. Away, you scullion. Ha! <laughs> Rampallion. Ha! <gasps> you fustilarian. Ha! <laughs> I'll tickle your catastrophe. What is the matter? Keep the peace here. Ho! Oh! Good, my lord. Be good to me. I beseech you, stand to me. How now, Sir John? What are you brawling here? You should have been well on your way to York. Send, send from him, fellow. Wherefore hands thou upon him? Oh, my most worshipful lord, and, and please your grace, I am a poor widow of East Cheap, and he is arrested at my suit. For what sum? It is for more than sum, my lord. It is for all I have. He has eaten me out of house and home. How comes this, Sir John? What man of good temper would enjoy this tempest of exclamation? Are you not ashamed to enforce the poor widows to so rough a cause to come by her own? What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Marry, if thou wert an honest man, thyself and the money too, thou didst swear to me, when the prince broke thy head for liking his father to a singing man of Windsor, thou didst swear to me then, as I was washing thy wound, to marry me and make me my lady thy wife. Canst thou deny it? And didst thou not kiss me and bid me fetch these shirty shillings? I put thee now to thy book oath. Deny it if thou canst. My lord, this is a poor mad soul. And she says up and down the town that her eldest son is like you. She hath been in good case. And the truth is poverty hath distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I beseech you, I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I am well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause the false way. You have, as it appears to me, practiced upon the easy yielding spirit of this woman and may have said your, your uses both in person and in person. Pay her the debt you owe her and then pay the villainy you have done with her. Come hither, hostess. Now, Master Gawa, what news? The King, my lord, and Harry, Prince of Wales, are near at hand. The rest the paper tells. Pray thee, Sir John, let it be but twenty nobles. If faith, I am loath to pawn my plate, go so God save me, law. Let it alone, I'll make other shift. You'll be full still. Well, you shall have it, though I pawn my gown. I hope you'll come to supper. You'll pay me all together. Will I live? Go with her, with her, hook on, hook on. Will you have doll tear sheet meet you at supper? Oh, no more words. Let's have her. I have heard better news. Uh, what's the news, my lord? Where lay the king tonight? At Basingstoke, my lord. Uh, I hope, my lord, all's well. Uh, what's the news, my lord? Come all his forces back? No. Fifteen hundred foot, five hundred horse are marched up to my lord of Lancaster against Northumberland and the archbishop. Come the king back from Wales, my noble lord. 
you shall have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, good Master Kowa. My lord! What's the matter? Master Gower, shall I entreat you with me to dinner? I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long. Being you are to take soldiers up in counties as you go. Uh, will you sup with me, Master Gower? What foolish master taught you this manners, Sir John? Master Gower, if they become me not, he was a fool that taught them me. Now the Lord enlighten thee. Thou art a great fool. Exeunt. Act two, scene two, London, another street. Enter the Prince Henry, Poynton's. <laughs> Weary is come to that. I had thought weariness does not have attached one of so high blood. Well, faith, it does me. Doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a comp composition. Be like then, my appetite was not princely got, for by my troth. I do now remember the poor creature, small beer. But indeed, these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. What a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name, or to know thy face tomorrow, or to take note of how many pair of silk stockings thou hast, vidalicit, these, and those that were thy peach-coloured ones, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and another for use. How ill it follows after you have laboured so hard to talk so idly. Tell me, how many good young princes would do so, their fathers being so sick as yours at this time is? Mary, I'll tell thee, Poins, it is not meet that I should be sad now my father is sick. Albeit I could tell to thee, as to one it pleases me for a better of a fault to call my friend. I could be sad. And sad indeed, too. Very hardly upon such a subject. By this hand, thou thinkest me as far in the devil's book as thou and Falstaff for obduracy and persistency. Let the end try the man. But I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is sick, and keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. The reason? What wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? I would think that the princely hypocrite. It would be every man's thought, and thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. And what a sight's your most worshipful thought to think so? Why? Because you have been so lewd and so much engraft to falls. <laughs> oh, and to me. Oh, by this light, the worst that can be say of me is that I am a second brother and that I am a proper fellow of my hands. Those two things I confess I cannot help. Oh, by the mass, here comes Bardolph. And the boy that I gave Falstaff, he had him from me Christian, and look if the fat villain have not transformed <laughs> him ape! <laughs> oh, save your grace! And yours, most noble Bardolph. Come, you virtuous ass, you bashful fool. Must you be blushing? Wherefore blush you now? What, what a mainly man at arms are you become? Is such a matter to get a pottle pot's maiden head? <laughs> uh, calls me e'en now, my lord, through a red lattice, and I could discern no part of his face from the window. At last I spied his eyes, and methought he had made two holes in the alewife's petticoat, and so peeped through. <laughs> a crown's worth of good interpretation. That is, boy. Uh, How doth thy master, Bardolph? Well, my lord, uh, uh, there's a letter for you. Mm. Uh, Delivered with good respect. Yeah, you heard your grace coming to town. 
I do allow this wen to be as familiar with me as my dog. And he who holds his place, for look you now how he writes. John Falstaff. <laughs> Knight! <laughs> Every man must know that. As oft as he has occasion to name himself, even like those that are kin to the king, for they never prick their finger, but they say, oh, there's some of the king's guards. <laughs> 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 How comes that, says, says he that takes him not to conceive? The answer is as ready as a borrower's cap. I am the king's poor cousin, sir. <laughs> Nay, they will be king to us or they will fetch it from Jafet. <laughs> but the letter. Mm. Sir John Falstaff, knight, to the son of the king nearest his father, Harry, Prince of Wales, greeting. Why, this is a certificate. Oh, peace. I will imitate the Romans in brevity. <laughs> he sure means brevity in breath. <laughs> Short winded. <laughs> <laughs> I commend me to thee. I commend thee and I leave thee. Be not too familiar with coins for he misuses thy favor so much that he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. Oh. Repent at idle times as thou mayest and so farewell thine be yea or no which is as much to say as thou usest him Jack Falstaff with my familiars, uh, John with my brothers and sisters and Sir John with all of Europe. <laughs> My lord, I'll steep this letter in sack and make him eat it. That's to make him eat twenty of his words. But do you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? <laughs> God send the witch no worse fortune than I never said so. <laughs> well, thus we play the fools of time and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London? Mm, yea, my lord. Where sups he? Doth the old boar feed in the old frank? At the old place, my lord, in East Cheap. Will sup any women with him? None, my lord, but old mistress quickly and the mistress doll tear sheet. What pagan may that be? A proper gentlewoman, sir, and a kinswoman to my masters. <laughs> Even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. <laughs> oh, oh! Shall we steal upon them, Ned? At supper, I am your shadow, my lord. Follow, Sarah, you boy, and Bardolph. No word to your master that I am yet come to town. There's for your silence. I have uh, no tongue, sir. Ah. And for mine, sir, I will govern it. Fare you well. Go. How might we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colours and not ourselves be seen? Put on two leathern jackets and aprons and wait upon him at his tables as drawers. From a god to a bull, the heavy dissension. It was Joe's case. From a prince to a prentice. A low transformation that shall be mine, for in everything the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Ned. Exeunt. Act two, scene three, Walkworth before Northumberland's castle. Enter Northumberland, his wife, Lady Northumberland, and Lady Percy, the wife to Harry Percy. I pray thee, loving wife and gentle daughter, give even way unto my rough affairs. I have given over. I will speak no more. Do what you will. Your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honour is at pawn, and but my going, nothing can redeem it. was, father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now, when your own Percy my heart's dear Harry, through many a north would look to see his father bring up his powers, but he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? 
there were two honors lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the kingdom of heaven brighten it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the gray vault of heaven. And by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. <laughs> He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youths did dress themselves. He had no legs that practiced not his gait, and speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, became the accents of the valiant, for those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him, so that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humors of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, oh, wondrous him, oh, miracle of men, him, did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war and disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem dispensable. So you left him, never, oh never, do his ghost the wrong to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. Had my sweet Harry had but half their numbers, today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Beshrew your heart, fair daughter. You do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. But I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. Oh! Fly it to Scotland! Tell that the nobles and the armed commons have of their crusades made a little taste. If they get the ground and vantage of the king, then join you with them like a rib of steel to make the strength stronger. But for all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son. He was so suffered. So came I, a widow and never shall have the length of life enough to rain upon remembrances with mine eyes that it may grow and sprout as high as heaven for recordation to my noble husband. Fain would I go to meet the archbishop, but many thousand reasons hold me back. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I till time and vantage crave my company. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 4, London, the Boar's Head Tavern in Eastcheap. Enter a drawer or two, Francis, and a second drawer. What the devil hast thou brought there? Apple John's? Thou knowest Sir John cannot endure an Apple John. <laughs> Master say it's true. The prince once set a dish of Apple John's before him and told him there were five more Sir John's and putting off his hat said, I will now take my leave of these six dry round old withered knights. <laughs> it, it angered him to the heart, but he hath forgot that. Why then cover and set them down and, and see if thou canst find out Sneak's noise. Mistress Tearsheet would fain hear some music. Oh, Sirrah. Here will be the prince and Master Poins anon, and they will put on two of our jerkins and aprons, and Sir John must not know of it. <laughs> Bardolph hath brought word. I'll see if I can find out Sneak. If faiths we are, methinks now you are in an excellent good temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinarily as heart would desire, and your color, I warrant you, is as red as any rose. In good truth, law. But if faith, you have drunk too much canaries. That's a marvellous searching wine and it perfumes the blood here. One can say, what's this? How do you now? Better than I was. Well, that's well said. A good heart's worth gold. Lo, here comes Sir John. When Arthur's first in court, empty the Jordan. <clears throat> and was... A worthy king. How now, Mistress Dull? Sick of a calm, yea, good faith. So is all her sect, and they be once in a calm, they are sick. A pox, da! 
damn you, you muddy rascal. Is that all the comfort you give me? You make fat rascals, Mistress Dalt. I make them. Gluttony and diseases make. I make them not. If the cook helped to make the gluttony, you help to make the diseases dull. We catch of you, dull. We catch of you. Grant that, my poor virtue. Grant that. Yea, joy, our chains and our jewels. At your brooches, pearls and ooches. For to serve bravely is to come halting off, you know. To come off the breach with his pike mm, bent bravely. And to surgery bravely. To venture upon the charged chambers bravely. Hang yourself, you muddy conger, hang yourself. By my troth, this is the old fashion. You two never meet, but you fall to some discord. You are both, in good truth, as rheumatic as two dry toasts. You cannot one bear with another's conformities. What the good year. One must bear, and that must be you. You are the weaker vessel, as they say. The emptier vessel. Can a weak, empty vessel bear such a huge full hogshead? There's a whole merchant's venture of Bordeaux stuff in him. You have not seen a hulk better stuffed in the hold. Come, I'll be friends with thee, Jack. <laughs> Thou art going to the wars, and whether I shall ever see thee again or no, there is nobody cares. Yes. Uh, sir, ancient pistols below and would speak with you. <sighs> Hang him, swaggering rascal, let him not come hither. He is the foul-mouthest rogue in England. If he swagger, let him not come here. No, by my faith, I must live among my neighbours. I'll know swaggerers, I am in good name, and fame with the very best. Shut the door, there comes no swaggerers here. Dost thou hear, hostess? Oh, pray pacify yourself, Sir John. Dost thou hear, it is mine ancient. Tilly Fally, Sir John, ne'er tell me and your ancient swaggerer comes not in my doors. I was before Martyr Tissick, the deputy, the other day, and he said to me, neighbour quickly, says he, receive those that are civil for, and he said, you are in an ill name, for, says he, you are an honest woman and well thought on, therefore take heed what guests you receive, receive, says he, no swaggering companions. There comes none here. No, I'll no swaggerers. He's no swaggerer, hostess. As a tame cheater, if fate, you may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. He'll not swagger with a barbary hen if her feathers turn back in any show of resistance. Call him up, draw. Cheater, you call him. I will bar no honest man my house, nor no cheater. But I do not love swaggering. Feel, masters, how I shake. Look, 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 I warrant you. <sighs> Oh, you do, hostess. Do I? Yea, very truth do I. And to an aspen leaf, I cannot abide swaggerers. God save you, Sir John. Ah, welcome, ancient pistol. Here, pistol, I charge you with a, with a cup of sack. Uh, do you discharge upon mine hostess? <laughs> I will discharge <laughs> upon her with two bullets. <laughs> no, 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 she is pistol proof, sir. You shall not hardly offend her. Come, I'll drink no proofs nor no bullets. I'll drink no more than will do me good. For no man's pleasure I. Uh, then... To you, Mistress Dorothy, I will charge you. Charge me? I scorn you, scurvy companion. Away, you rogue. Away, you mouldy rogue, away. I am meat for your master. I know you, Mistress Dorothy. Away, you cut-purse rascal, you filthy bung, away by this wine. I'll thrust my knife in your mouldy chaps and you play the saucy coddle with me. Let me not live, but I will murder your rough for this. No, no more, Pistol. I would not have you go up here. Discharge yourself out of our company, Pistol. No, good Captain Pistol. Not here, sweet Captain. Captain, 
You, a captain, you slave for what? For tearing a poor whore's ruff in a baldy house? He, a captain, hang him, rogue. Gravy, go down, good ancient. Hark thee hither, Mistress Doll. Not I. I tell thee what, Corporal Bardolph, I could tear her. I'll be revenged of her. Gravy, go down. Be her damned first, to Pluto's damned lake by this hand. In the infernal deep, in Erebus, and tortures vile also. Old hook and line, say I. Down! Down, dogs! Down, faitors! Have we not Hiron here? Oh. Your Captain Peasel, be quiet. Tis very late, in face. I beseech you now, aggravate your collar. Oh, pack horses and hollow pack with James Vader compared with Caesars, with cannibals, with croaking Greeks, nay. Rather damp them with King Cerberus and let the welkin roar. Shall we fall foul for toys? By my troth, Captain, these are very bitter words. Be gone, good ancient. This'll grow to a brawl anon. Men like dogs give crowns like pins. Have we not hiring here? There's none such here. For God's sake, be quiet. Go get some sack. D fortune me tormente, sperate me contento. Fear we broadsides? No. Let the fiend give fire. Give me some sack. And sweetheart, lie thou there. Come. We the full points here, and our et ceteras, no things. Pistol, I would be quiet. Sweet knight, I kiss thy neath. What? We have seen the seven stars. God's sake, thrust him downstairs. I cannot endure such a fustian rascal. Thrust him downstairs. Thrust him downstairs. Quack. Are we not Galloway he nags? Quack him down, Bardolf, like a shove groat shilling. Nay, if he do nothing but speak nothing, he shall be nothing here. Come, get you downstairs. What? Shall we have incisions? Shall we imbrew? Give me my rapier, boy. Ah. I pray thee, Jack, I pray thee, do not draw. Get thee downstairs. Ha! Ah! Oh. Here's a goodly tumult. I'll forswear keeping out afore I'll be in these tyrants and frights. So, murder, I warrant now. Alas, alas, put up your naked weapons. Put up your naked weapons. Ah! Yeah! <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah! Oh. Let's go. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yes! Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Oh, Jack, be quiet. The rascal's gone. Oh, you horse and little valiant villain, you. Have you not hurt in the groin? <sighs> Me thought he made a shrewd thrust at your belly. Oh, have you turned him out of doors? Yes, sir. Uh... The rascal's drunk, you've uh, <clears throat> heard him in the shoulder. Ha ha ha! A rascal to brave me! Oh, you sweet little road, you. Alas, poor ape, how thou sweatest. Oh. Come, yes. let me wipe your, thy face. <laughs> Faith, I love thee. Thou art as valorous as Hector of Troy, worth five of Agamemnon, and ten times better than the nine worthies, a villain. Oh, a rascally slave. I will toss the rogue in a blanket. Do, and thou darest for thy heart, and thou dost, I'll canvas thee between a pair of sheets. <laughs> Sit on my knee, doll. Uh, a rascal bragging slave. The rogue fled from me like quicksilver. 
I faith, and thou followedst him like a church. Thou horse and little tidy Bartholomew boar pig. When wilt thou leave fighting a days and foining a night and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? Oh, peace, good doll. Do not speak like a death's head. Ha! Do not bid me remember mine end. Sarah, what's, what humours the prince of? Oh, a good, shallow young fellow. He would have made a good pantler. He would have chipped bread well. <laughs> they say Poins has a good wit. Uh, he, a good wit? Hang here, baboon! His wit's as thick as Chinksbury mustard. There's no more conceit in him than is in a mallet. <laughs> now, I can tell you, then, why, why, the the prince, why the prince does love him so, well, I shall tell you. It is because their legs are both of a bigness. Yes, and rides the wild mare with the boys and jumps upon joint stools and swears with a good grace and wears his boots very smooth like unto the sign of the leg and breeds no bait with the telling of discreet stories and such other gamble faculties he has that show a weak mind and an able body for which the prince admits him. For the prince himself is such another. Not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off. Fit to beat him before his whore. Oh, look where the withered elder hath not his pole clawed like a parrot. It's not strange the desire should so many years outlive performance. Uh, kiss me, doll. Uh, Saturn and Venus this year in conjunction. What says the almanac to that? And look whether the fiery trigon, his man, be lisping to his master's old tables, his note, his council keeper. <laughs> Thou dost give me flattering buses. <laughs> By my troth, I kiss thee with a most constant heart. Oh, I am old. I am old. I love thee better than I love ever a scurvy young boy of them all. Oh, what stuff wilt thou have a kirtle of? I shall receive money a Thursday, shall have a cap tomorrow. Oh, a merry song. Come, it grows late. We'll to bed. Thou'lt forget me when I'm gone. By my truth, thou set me a-weeping and thou sayest so. Prove that ever I dress myself handsome till thy return. Well, hearken at the end. <laughs> Some sack, Francis! Anon, anon, sir. Anon, sir. A bastard son of the king's. And art thou points his brother? <laughs> Why, thou globe of sinful continence. What a life dost thou lead? Uh, better than thou. I am a gentleman, and thou art a draw. <laughs> yeah. Very true, sir, and I am to come to draw you out by the ears. Oh, the Lord preserve thy grace. By my troth, welcome to London. Now, Lord bless that sweet face of thine. Oh, Jeezy, why you come from Wales? Thou! Horse son, mad compound of majesty. By this light flesh and corrupt blood, thou art welcome. You, horse and candle mine, you, how vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentlewoman? Didst thou hear me? Yea, and you knew me as you did when you ran away by Gad's Hill. You knew I was at your back and spoke it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 not so. I did not think thou wast within hearing. I shall drive you then to confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No, no abuse, how? 
on mine honour, no abuse. Not to just dispraise me and call me pantler and bread chipper. Oh, and I know not what. No, no abuse, Hal. No abuse? No, <laughs> no abuse, Hal. Ned, in the world. Ned, none, no. <laughs> I dispraised him before the wicked that the wicked turns to the prince might not fall in love with me, in which doing I have done the part of a careful friend and a true subject, and thy father is to give me thanks for it. No <laughs> abuse, Hal. None, Ned, none. No faith, boys, none. See now where the pure fear and entire cowardice doth not make thee wrong this virtuous gentlewoman to close with us. Is she of the wicked? Is thine hostess here of the wicked? <gasps> or is that boy of the wicked? Or honest Bardolf, whose zeal burns in the nose of the wicked? Answer, thou dead elm, answer. The fiend hath pricked down Bardolf, irrecoverable, and his face is Lucifer's privy kitchen, where he doth nothing but roast malt worms. For the boy, <laughs> there is a good angel about him, but the devil binds him too. For the women? Ah, for one of them, she's already in hell and burns poor souls. <laughs> for the other, I owe her money? And whether she be damned for that, I know not. No, I warrant you. Who knocks so loud at the door? Look to the door there, Francis. Ah, oh, Peto! How now? What news? The king your father is at Westminster, and there are twenty weak and wearied posts come from the north. And as I came along, I met and overtook a dozen captains bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and every one asking for Sir John Falstaff. By heaven, Coins, I feel me much to blame so idly to profane the precious time. Give me my sword and cloak. Falstaff, good night. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night, and we must hence and leave it unpicked. More knocking at the door. Oh, how now, what's the matter? Oh, you must away to court, sir, presently. A dozen captains stay at door for you. Oh. Farewell, hostess. Farewell, doll. You see, my good wenches, our men of merit are sought after. The undeserver may sleep when the man of action is called on. Farewell, good wenches. If I be not sent away post, I will see you again ere I go. I cannot speak if my heart be not ready to burst. Well, sweet Jack, have a care of thyself. Farewell. Farewell. Well, fare thee well. I have known thee these 29 years, come peace, God time, but an honest and a truer hearted man. Well, fare thee well. Mistress Tearsheet! What's the matter? Bid Mistress Tearsheet come to my master. Oh, run, doll, run, run, good doll. Exeunt. Act 3, Scene 1, Westminster, a palace room. Enter the king in his nightgown alone, followed by a servant. Go call the earls of Surrey and of Warwick, but ere they come, bid them all read these letters and well consider of them. Make good speed. 
How many thousands of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Oh, sleep. Oh, gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse, how have I frighted thee, that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness. Oh, thou dull god, why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds and leafs to the kingly couch a watch case or a common larum bell? Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship boy's eyes and rock his brains in cradle of the rude imperious surge and in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamor in the slippery clouds that with the hurly death itself awakes. Canst thou, O oh partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude and in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king? Then happy low lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, lords? Tis one o'clock and past. Why, then, good morrow to you all, my lords. Have you read all the letters I sent you? We have, my liege. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. It is but as a body yet distempered which to his former strength may be restored with good advice and little medicine. My Lord Northumberland will soon be called. Oh, God, that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times make mountains level and the continent weary of solid firmness melt itself into the sea. Tis not ten years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together, and in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years since this Percy was the man nearest my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot, yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard gave him defiance. But which of you was by? You. Cousin Neville, as I re may remember, when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and raided by Northumberland, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy. Northumberland, thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. Though, then, God knows, I had no such intent, but that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. The time will come that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. So went on foretelling this same time's condition and the division of our amity. There is a history in all men's lives. The which observed a man may prophesy with a near aim of the main chance of things as yet not come to life, who in their seeds and weak beginning lie in treasured. And by the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guest that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness, which should not find a ground to root upon unless on you. Are these things then necessities? Then let us meet them like necessities. And that same word even now cries out on us. They say the bishop in Northumberland are 50,000 strong. It cannot be, my lord. Rumour doth double, like the voice and echo, the numbers of the feared. Please it, your grace, to go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you have already sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. To comfort you the more, I have received a certain instance that Glen Dower is dead. Your Majesty hath been this fortnight ill, and these unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I will take your counsel. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the Holy Land. 
Exeunt. Act 3, Scene 2, Gloucestershire, Court Before Shallow's House. Enter Justice Shallow and Justice Silence, meeting Mouldy, Shadow, Wart, Feeble, Bullcalf. Come on, come on, give me your hand, sir, give me your hand, sir. An early stirrer by the rood. And how doth my good cousin Silence? Oh, good morrow, good cousin Shallow. And how doth my cousin your bedfellow? And your fairest daughter and mine, my goddaughter Ellen? Oh, how black woozel, cousin Shallow. Why, yea and no, sir. I dare say my cousin William is become a good scholar. He is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, sir, to my cost. We must then to the inns of court shortly. I was once at Clement's Inn, where I think they will talk of mad shallow yet. Oh, you are called lusty shallow then, cousin. Oh, by the mass. I was called anything, and I would have done anything, and indeed too, and roundly too. Oh, there was, there was I, and little John Doit of Staffordshire, and Black George Barnes, and... Frank Pickbone and, and, and Will Squeal, a console man. Oh, you had not four such swinge bucklers in all the inns of court. And I may say to you, we knew where the Bonarobus were and had the best of them all at commandment. Then was Jack Falstaff, now Sir John, a boy, and page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. This Sir John cousin that comes hither and on about soldiers. The same Sir John, that very same. Oh, I see him break Scoggins' head at the court gate when he was a crack, not, not this high. And the very same day did I fight with one Samson Stockfish. Jeez oh, you, jeez you, the mad days I have spent. And to see how many of my old acquaintance are dead. We shall all follow soon, cousin. Certain, tis certain. Very sure, tis certain. Death, as the psalmist says, is certain to all. All shall die. Is old double of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, dead. I drew a good bow and... And dead, I shot a fine shoot. Donna Gaunt loved him well and bet as much money on his head. Dead? Here come two of Sir John's Falstaff's men, as I think. I beseech you, which is just as shallow. I am Robert Shallow, sir, a poor esquire of this county and one of the King's Justices of the Peace. What is your good pleasure with me? My captain, sir, commands him to my captain, Sir John Falstaff, a tall gentleman by heaven and a most gallant leader. Oh, he greets me well, sir. I knew him a good backsword man. How doth the good knight? Uh, uh, may I ask how my lady's wife does? <laughs> sir, pardon me. A uh, <clears throat> soldier is uh, better accommodated than with a wife. It is well said, in fact, sir. <laughs> it is well said indeed, too. Better accommodated, it is oh. good. Yea, indeed it is. Good phrases are surely and ever were very commendable. <laughs> accommodated, it comes of a commodo. Very good, very good, a good phrase. It is just, oh, look, here comes Sir John. <laughs> Give me your hand. <laughs> Give me your worship's good hand. By my troth, you look well and bear your years very well. <laughs> Welcome, good Sir John. <laughs> I'm glad to see you well, good Master Robert Shallow. Uh, Master Shortcard, as I think. Uh, no, sir, it, it is my cousin Silence in commission with me. Ah, good Master Silence, it well befits you, you should be of the peace. Your good worship is welcome. Oh, 
fie, this is hot weather, gentlemen. Uh, have you provided me here half a dozen sufficient men? <laughs> Mary, have we, sir? Will you sit? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, let me see them, I beseech you. Oh, my. Where's the robe? Where's the robe? Where? Oh. Where's the robe? Um, let me see. Let me see. Um, let me see. Um, so. So, so, um, so, 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 um, um, yay, man. oh, oh, mm -hmm. oh, oh. <clears throat> Rafe and Moldy, let them appear as I call, let them do so, let them do so, let me see, where's Moldy? He, here, and it please, yeah? What, what think you, Sir John, a, a good-limbed fellow, a young, strong, of good friends? Is thy name Moldy? Yeah, and it please you. Oh, Tis the time thou wert used. <laughs> A most excellent defence. Things that are mouldy lack use. Oh, very singular good effect. Well said, Sir John. Very well said. Uh, pricking. But, but I was pricked well enough before, and, and you could have let me alone. My old dame will be undone now for one to do her husbandry uh, uh, uh. and her drudgery. You need not to have pricked me. There are other men fitter to go out than I. Uh, go to peace, Moldy. You shall go. Moldy, it is time you were spent. Spent? Peace, fellow. Peace. Stand aside. Not you where you are. Uh, for the other Sir John, um, let me see. Um, uh, Simon Shadow. Oh, yay, Mary, let me have him to sit under. He's like to be a cold soldier. <laughs> Where's Shadow? Uh, 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 here, sir! <clears throat> here, sir. Shadow, whose son art thou? Oh, um, my mother's son, sir. Oh, thy mother's son. Like enough, and thy father father's shadow. So the son of the female is the shadow of the male. It is often so indeed, but much of the father's substance. Do you like him, Sir John? Mm. Shadow will serve for summer. Prick him. Aside, for we have a number of shadows to fill up the muster book. Thomas Wart. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Where is he? I hear, sir. Oh, uh, is, oh, God, is thy name Wart? Yes, sir. Thou art a very ragged Wart. Do I prick him, Sir John? Oh, it were superfluous. His apparel is built upon his back, and the whole frame stands upon pins. Prick him no more. <laughs> you can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. Um... Francis Feeble. Oh, uh, here, sir. Uh, what trade are thou, Feeble? Uh, a woman's tailor, sir. Uh, shall I prick him, sir? Uh, you may, but if he had been a man's tailor, he'd have pricked you. <laughs> now, wilt thou make as many holes in an enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? Well, I, I will do my goodwill, sir. You can have no more. Well said, good woman's tailor. Well said, courageous feeble. Thou wilt be as valiant as the wrathful dove, or most magnanimous mouse. <laughs> Prick the woman's tailor. Well, Master Shallow, deep Master Shallow. I, I would wart might have gone, sir. Well, I would thou wert a man's tailor, that thou might mend him and make him fit to go. I cannot put him to a private soldier that is the leader of so many thousands. Uh, let that suffice, most forcible feeble. It shall suffice, sir. But I am bound to thee, Reverend Feeble. Who is next? Um... Peter Bullcalf of the Green. Oh, yes, Mary, let's see. Bullcalf. Here, sir. For God, a likely fellow. Come, prick Bullcalf till he roar again. Oh, Lord good, my Lord Captain. What dost thou roar before thou art pricked? 
Oh, Lord, sir. I am a diseased man. Oh, God, no. What, what, what disease has thou? A horse done cold, sir. A cough, sir, which I caught with ringing in the king's affairs upon his coronation day, sir. Mm. Come, thou shalt go to the wars in a gown. We will have away thy cold, and I will take such order that thy friend shall ring for thee. <sighs> yeah. Is here all? Uh, here is two more called than your number. Uh, you must have but four here, sir. And so I pray go into dinner with me. Oh, come, I, I will go drink with you, but I cannot tarry dinner. Oh, I am glad to see you by my troth, Master Shallow. Oh, Sir John, do you remember since we lay all night in the windmill in St George's Field? Uh, oh. No more. Master Shallow, no more of that. Oh, it was a merry night. And is Jane Nightwork alive? She lives, Master Shallow, she lives. She never could away with me. No, never, never. She would always say she could not abide, Master Shallow. Oh, by the mass, I could anger her to the heart. <laughs> she was then a bona roba. And does she hold her own well? A uh, bona roba, yeah. Old. Old, Master Shallow. Hey, she must be old. She can't choose but be old. Certain she's old and had Robin night work by old night work before I came to Clement's Inn. That's 55 year ago. Oh, cousin Silence, had thou scenes that I and this night have seen. <laughs> said John, said I well. Oh, we have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. Oh, that we have, that we have, that we have. E faith, Sir John, we have. Our watchword was, Hem boys! Hem boys! Oh, come, let's to dinner, let's to dinner. Oh, Jesus, the days we have seen. Come, come. <laughs> Good Master Corporate Bardock. Stand, my friend, and here's four Harry ten shillings in French crowns for you, sir. In very truth, sir, I had as lief be hanged, sir, as go, and yet for mine own part, sir, I do not care, but rather because I am unwilling, and for mine own part, have a desire to stay here with my friends. Else, sir, I did not care for my own part so much. Go to. Stand aside. And good Master Corporal, Captain, for my old dame's sake, stand, my friend. She, she has nobody to do anything about her when I'm gone, and she is old and, and cannot help herself. You, you shall have 40, sir. Go to. Stand aside. Well, by my troth, I care not. A man can die but once. We owe God a death. I'll ne'er bear a base mind. And it be my destiny, so, and it be not, so. No man's too good to serve as prince, and let it go which way it will. He that dies this year is quick for the next. Well said. Uh, Faith, I'll... Thou art a good fellow. I'll bear no base mind. <clears throat> All right, uh, come, sir. Which men shall I have? Um, four of which you please. Uh, sir, a word. Mm. Uh, I have three pound to free mouldy and bull calf. Oh, go too well. Come, Sir John, which four will you have? Uh, do you choose for me? Um, marry then, uh, mouldy bull calf, feeble and shallow. Mouldy and bull calf? Ah, for you, mouldy, stay at home. You are past service. And for your part, bull calf, Grow till you come unto it. I will none of you. Sir John, Sir John, do not yourself wrong. These are your likeliest men, and I would have you served with the best. Will you tell me, Master Shallow, how to choose a man? Care I for the limb, the thews, the stature, Bulk and big semblance of a man. Give me spirit, Master Shallow. Oh, give me the spare men and spare me the great ones. Put me a caliber into Wart's hand, Bardolph. Uh, hold what? Uh, Travers. Yeah. Yes. 
Thus it. Thus. These fellows will do well, Master Shallow. God keep you, Master Silence. I will not use many words with you. Fare you well, gentlemen, both. I thank you. I must a dozen mile tonight. Uh, Bardolph, give the soldiers coats. Good John, the Lord bless you. God prosper your affairs. God send us peace at your return. Visit our house. Let our old acquaintance be renewed. Uh, per adventure, I will with ye to the court. Poor oh God, would you would? Go to, I have spoken a word. God keep you. Fare you well, gentlemen. On, Bardolph, lead the men away. <clears throat> As I return, I will fetch off these justices. I do see the bottom of justice shallow. Lord, Lord, how subject we old men are to this vice of lying. This same starved justice had done nothing but prate to me of the wildness of his youth and every third word a lie. Now, I do remember him at Clement's Inn like a man made after a supper of a cheese pairing. Mm. When he was naked, he was for all the world like a forked radish with a head fantastically carved upon it with a knife. He was so forlorn that his dimensions to any thick sight were invisible. He was the very genius of famine, yet lecherous as a monkey. And the whores called him Mandrake because he had a really sort of rooty penis. And now is this vice's dagger become a squire? and talks as familiarly as John of Gaunt, as if he had been sworn brother to him, and I'll be sworn he ne'er saw him but once. <sighs> well, I'll be acquainted with him if I return, and shall go hard, but I'll make him a philosopher's two stones to me. Exit. Act 4, Scene 1, Yorkshire, within the Forest of Galtree. Enter the Bishop of York, Mowbray, Lord Bardolph, Hastings and others within the Forest of Galtree. What is this forest called? Tis Galtree Forest, and shall please your grace. Uh, here stand, my lords, and send discoveries forth to know the numbers of our enemies. We have sent forth already. Mm, Tis well done. My friends and brethren, in these great affairs, I must acquit you that I have received new dated letters from Northumberland. He is retired to, his, to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland and concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may overlive the hazards and fearful meeting of their opposites. Thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces. Now what news? West of this forest, scarcely off a mile, in goodly form comes on the enemy. And by the ground they hide, I judge their number upon or near the rate of 30,000. The just proportion that we gave them out. Let us slay and face them in the field. What? What well-appointed leader fronts us here? I think it is my Lord of Westmoreland. <laughs> Health and fair greeting from our general, the Prince, Lord John, and Duke of Lancaster. Mm -hmm. Say on, Lord of Westmoreland, in peace, what doth concern your coming? Then, my Lord, unto your grace do I in chief address the substance of my speech. If that rebellion came like itself in base and abject rout, I say, if damned commotion so appeared in his true, native, and most proper shape, you, reverend father, and these noble lords had not been here to dress the ugly form of base and bloody insurrection with your fair honors. You, Lord Bishop, the dove, and very blessed spirit of peace, Wherefore do you so ill translate yourself out of the speech of peace 
that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war. Briefly, to this end, we are all diseased, and with our suffering and wanton hours, have brought ourselves into a burning fever, and we must bleed for it. Of which disease our late King Richard, being infected, died. I have in equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our armies may do, what wrongs we suffer, and find our griefs heavier than our offences. We have the summary of all our griefs, when time shall serve to know in articles, which long ere this we offer to the king, and might by no suit gain our audience. When we are wronged and would unfold our griefs, we are denied access unto his person, even by those men that most have done us wrong. When ever yet was your appeal denied? <laughs> Wherein have you been galled by the king, that you should seal this lawless bloody brook of forged rebellion with a seal divine? My brother, General, the Commonwealth, I make my quarrel in particular. There is no need of any such redress, or if there were, it not belongs to you. Why not to him in part, and to us all, that feel the bruises of the day before, and suffer the condition of these times, to lay a heavy and unequal hand upon our honours? Oh, my good Lord Marbury, construe the times to their necessities, and you shall say, indeed, it is the time and not the king that doth you injuries. Yet for your part, it not appears to me, either from the king or in the present time, that you should have any an inch of any ground to build a grief on. Were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk signories, your noble and right well-remembered fathers? What thing in honor had my father lost? that need be revived and breathed in me. The king that loved him as the state stood then was forced perforce compelled to banish him. And then Henry Bolingbroke and he, being mounted and both roused in their seats, their neighing coursers daring of the spur, their arms staves in charge, their beavers down and their eyes of sparkling fire through the sights of steel. And then the loud trumpet blowing them through together then, then, when there was nothing that could have stayed my father from the breast of Bolingbroke, oh, when the king did throw his warder down, his own life hung upon the staff he threw, then, then threw he down himself all the lives that by indictment and dint of sword. You speak. Lord Mulberry, now you know not what. The Earl of Hereford was reputed then in England the most valiant gentleman. Who knows on whom fortune would then have smiled? <laughs> but this is mere digression from my purpose. Here come I from our princely general to know your griefs, to tell you from his grace that he will give you audience, and wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. But he hath forced us to compel this offer, and it proceeds from policy, not love. Mulberry, you overween to take it so. This offer comes from mercy, not from fear. For lo, within the king, again, our army lies. Upon mine honor, all too confident to give admittance to a thought of fear. Our battle is more full of names than yours. Our men are more perfect in use of, the, of their arms. Our armor all as strong, our cause the best. Then reason will our hearts should be as good. Say you not then our offer is compelled. Well, by my will, we shall admit no parley. That argues but the shame of your offense. A rotten case abides no handling. Hath the Prince John a full commission to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? That is intended in the General's name. Then take, my Lord of Westmoreland, this schedule. This contains our general grievances. This will I show the General. Please you, Lords, in sight of both our battles we may meet and either end in peace, which God so frame, or to the place of difference call the swords, which must decide it. 
My lord, we will do so. There is a thing within my bosom it tells me that no condition of our peace can stand. Fear you not that. If we can make our peace upon such large terms and so absolute as our condition shall consist upon, our peace shall stand as firm as rocky mountains. Yeah, but our valuation shall be such that every slight and false derived cause shall be to the king taste of this action. No, no, my lord, note this. The king is weary of dainty and, and such pickering grievances, for he hath found to end one doubt by death rives too greater in the heirs of life. His foes are so enrooted with his friends that plucking to unfix an enemy, he doth unfasten so and shake a friend, so that this land, like an offensive wife that hath enraged him on to offer strokes as he is striking, holds his infant up and hangs resolved correction in the arm that was upreared to execution. Besides, the king hath wasted all his rods on late offenders that now doth lack the very instruments of chastisement, so that his power, like to a fangless lion, may offer but not hold. Tis very true, and therefore be assured, my good Lord Marshal, if we do not make our atonement well, our peace will, like a broken limb, unite, grow stronger for the breaking. Be it so. Here's returned, my Lord of Westmoreland. The Prince is here at hand. Pleaseth your Lordship to meet his Grace, just distance tween our armies. Your Grace of York, in God's name then, step forward before and greece is grace my lord we come they march about the stage and then move forward to meet prince john act four scene two yorkshire another part of the forest of galtree enter prince john of lancaster mowbray lord hastings earl of westmoreland richard's group archbishop of york and officer You are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle Lord Archbishop. And so to you, Lord Hastings, and to all. My Lord of York, it better showed with you when that your flock assembled by the bell in circle to hear with reverence your exposition on the holy text, than now to see you here an iron man talking, cheering a rout of rebels with your drum, turning word to sword and life to death. That man that sits within a monarch's heart and ripens in the sunshine of his favour. Alack, what mischiefs might he set a brooch in the shadow of such greatness? With you, Lord Bishop, it is even so. Who hath not heard it spoken, how deep you were within the books of God? To us, the speaker in his parliament, to us, the imagined voice of God himself, the very opener and intelligentsia between the grace, the sanctities of heaven and our dull workings. Oh, who shall believe but you misuse the reverence of your place, employ the countenance and grace of heaven as a false favourite doth his prince's name in these dishonourable you have taken up. Under the counterfeited zeal of God, the subjects of his substitute, my father, and both against the peace of heaven and him, have here upswarmed him. Good, my lord of Lancaster. I am not here against. In common sense, crowd us and crush us to this monstrous form to hold our safety up. I send your grace this parcel in particular of our griefs, the which hath been with scorn shoved from the court, whereon the hydra son of war is born whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed asleep with grant of our most just and I like them all and do allow them well and swear by the honour of my blood my father's purposes have been mistook and some about him have too lavishly wrestled his meaning and authority my lords these griefs shall be with speed redressed upon my soul they shall if this may please you, discharge your powers unto their several counties, as we will ours, and here between the armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace, that all their eyes may bear these tokens home of our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it you, and will maintain my word. 
and thereupon I drink unto your grace. Go, Captain, and deliver to the army this news of peace. Let them have pay and part. I know it will please them well. Hi thee, Captain. To you, my noble lord of Westmoreland. Health to my lord and gentle cousin Mulberry. You wish me health and happy time, for I am on the sudden something ill. Against ill chances, men are ever merry, but heaviness foreruns the good event. Therefore be merry, cuz, since mm. sudden sorrow serves to say thus, some good thing comes tomorrow. Believe me, I am passing light in spirit. So much the worse if your will be true. <laughs> The word of peace is rendered. Hark how they shout. This has been cheerful after victory. A peace is of the nature of a conquest. For then both parties are nobly subdued and neither party loser. Go, my lord, and let our army be discharged too. And good, my lord, so please you, let our trains march by us that we may peruse the men we should have copped with all. Go, good Lord Hastings, and ere they be dismissed, let them march by. <laughs> I trust, lords, we shall lie tonight together. Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? The leaders having charge from you to stand will not go off until they hear you speak. They know their duties. My lord, <laughs> our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked, they take their courses, east, west, north, south, or like a school broke up, each hurries toward his home and sporting place. Good tidings, my lord Hastings, for the which I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason, and you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mulberry. Of capital treason, I attach you both. Is this proceeding just and honorable? Is your assembly so? Will you break your faith? I pawned thee none. I promised you redress of these same grievances whereof you did complain, which by mine honor I will perform with the most Christian care. But for you, rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion and such acts as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray. God, and not we, has safely fought today. Some guard these traitors to the block of death, treason's true bed, and yielder up of breath. <sighs> Exeunt. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your five minute interval. You now have five minutes to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves and prepare for the second half to commence at approximately five past 9 p.m. BST. Uh, if the rest of the crew and Jeremy, if you'd like to join me at this time, it'd be lovely to have you. We'll see if we can take a couple of questions from our audience. Thank you so much, actors doing a tremendous job and swings as well. We've already seen both of them. It's been an eventful night backstage here, but the show has got, gone on very very smoothly so thank you all so much for that. Sarah I believe you have an update for us from Patreon. I do yes so first of all as always a huge huge thank you to all of our existing patrons um, your ongoing support is hugely hugely um, appreciated by everyone involved in the project uh, so I've got some new donors that I want to shout out um, to this week so we have got Karen Y, Eugenia L, Heather D, Dika R, Jen D, David L, Elaine M, Johan R, and Gillian B. So thank you so, so much to all of you, our new patrons. Um, we're so happy to have your very um, uh, generous donations uh, for the project. Um, and we 
uh, this week as well, our existing patrons would have seen that we've already had uh, some exclusive bits of content for you. So we've had a bonus word of the week. Uh, we've had an exclusive first look into the rehearsal room. Um, and later on this week, uh, you will also be treated to um, a, a special piece called um, Views from the Actors' Windows. So you'll get to see a little bit um, inside um, where all of our actors are based around the world. Um, and there will also be another fantastic vlog from one of our actors in this week's show. So if you want to access any of that uh, exclusive content, uh, please do sign up to the Patreon. Uh, the link is in the description of this video. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel and post your reactions using the hashtag show must go online, which... No, no, I've got to say it this time. And tag us at TSMG Online Live on Twitter and at The Show Must Go Online and Insta and Facebook. So, uh, Jeremy, just a couple of questions coming through from the audience so far. Uh, first one, is this the booziest play in Shakespeare? Oh, wow. Well, there's certainly lots of opportunity for boozing and Falstaff does have a long speech about sack. So I think it, it probably is up there. Absolutely. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, just out of interest for me, what is what is your favourite moment in this play, I guess, if you had to pick one? Well, I think it probably is the, the little encounter between Falstaff and, and Shallow, uh, which is just so touching. But looking at it, it's so full of moments. There's so much going on. It's just brilliant. No, it really is. I think the, the cast are doing amazingly well. Oh, thank you so much, man. Really appreciate that. Uh, yes, no, they're doing a tremendous job, really enjoying the work and really enjoying all of the uh, sudden appearances as well, which is always fun to see. I can see our groundlings have been really enjoying that as well. Uh, yes, very nice, very nice. Sarah, do you have any questions from the groundlings? Um, none coming through just yet. Um, no, but one thing too that much has applause been picked up on. rolling in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that's been picked up on is uh, some of the callbacks we've had to oh. um, previous uh, plays and obviously shows that we have done, which, is, which has been really interesting, kind of tying some of those loose ends together. So obviously we had the joust um, and then we had the, the Hal Hotspur fight um, as well, which was flipped. Especially yes, this. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I guess it's um, always looking to use the medium for what it's good for in a way. Uh, we now have uh, a growing archive. Uh, and I think especially um, it's something that you said, Jeremy, that just really resonated with me uh, about this play is the idea of it being autumnal. And the fact that it, it feels to me like it, it really is gathering towards an ending. Um, mm -hmm. And it's why I suppose the the Henry ad in a way, uh, Henry V to me feels almost like a, a, a separate uh, thing. This, this to me feels like the end of the Richard II journey in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Henry, the Henry V has got some very, very dark moments in it, but, but it, it's a different kind of darkness. And I think this is really autumnal. It's, it's kind of, you know, getting up by the fire and roasting chestnuts. That's what this play is all about. <laughs> Absolutely. I've uh, got a question here. Uh, could we talk about the difference between Hal and Prince John, Jeremy? Any, any impressions on the difference between them as people? Well, I mean, Prince John has got a heart of stone, hasn't he? I mean, that, I think that, you know, it, it, we have to look back at Henry the Fourth and and say that he he is really suffering from having done what he's done, um, and he's being eaten away inside. But John, I think, has none of that. John is just as hard as stone, really. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting that. John almost gets the hotspur moment here in that he puts down the rebellion, but the way in which he goes about it is so cold-blooded and so strategic. Whereas what Hal did was almost chivalric. It was, you know, it's this one-on-one -on -one yes. duel with a hero, right? And yet uh, the way John did it, so different and, and quite yeah. sinister, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Hal's, Hal's a human being compared to John, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I've got um, a question here. Is this the last we'll see of Poins? Is this the last word? Well, indeed. Um, I know we see pimp points again. Points will be back, <laughs> which is good. Like the I love credits them. of a James Bond film, points will return. Yes. Points will return. <laughs> uh, I spotted an, another question, which was how historically accurate uh, is this play? Uh, it, it's completely, well, it's, it's accurate, but 
Shakespeare plays with time, you know, fast and loose. Um, in fact, I mean, there was there was over eight years, ten years between the Battle of Shrewsbury and the Prelates' Rebellion, and and Shakespeare makes it happen almost instantaneously. Um, he he's he's done a brilliant editing job. Um, so most of the things that do happen did happen, but they happened over a much much longer period. Wonderful, wonderful. And I, I must apologise as well, Jeremy. Uh, this is the uh, is it the tenth longest play, Sarah? This one. Did we discover? I think so, yes. Yeah. And so apologies, we, we had to call, we had to make some hard decisions about where we're going to make efficiencies. And uh, you talked about that beautiful uh, speech from Mistress Quickly about Falstaff's proposal. Sadly, ah, feel terrible now we didn't get it in there. Uh, but if you well, just you briefly did, like I got speak it. to the quality. I got it in there. <laughs> yes, I, put, absolutely. I put it in there for you. <laughs> you did, you did. And I'm sorry that we, <laughs> we took it out. <laughs> uh, but what? But if you'd like to speak briefly to uh, just what uh, what it is that you love about that particular moment, well, it's you know it's extraordinary. It actually reminds me of Dickens, um, who is a, another writer that I really love. But it is just that detail. You're taken there. You're you're there at Mistress Quickly's side, and you really believe that it happened. And it's so important. This is the most important thing that happened to her. Yeah, I mean, it's when she started losing money to that terrible man. Um, but uh, it's just so beautifully put. It's beautifully written. And it is prose. And that's, that's the thing about this, this play is that it is well over half of it is in prose. But it is the most beautifully structured prose. Um, it's really extraordinary. Absolutely. So I wonder, we'll pick this up again in the post-show discussion, but I wonder whether there might be space for Lucy to give us a reading of that speech as a Patreon exclusive. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. So uh, if I could ask you now both to uh, retire to uh, the backstage area, please, as the second half is about to commence. Uh, audience, please do share your reactions using the hashtag show must go online and enjoy the second half of Shakespeare's Henry IV, part two. Act four, scene three. <laughs> Yorkshire, another part of the forest of Galtree. Enter Falstaff and Collerville, meeting. What's your name, sir? Of what condition are you and of what place? I am a knight, sir, and my name is Carleville of the Dale. Well then, Carleville is your name, a knight is your degree, and your place, the Dale. Carleville shall still be your name, a traitor your degree, and the dungeon your place, a place deep enough, so shall you still be Carleville of the Dale. Are you not Sir John Falstaff? <laughs> as good a man as he, sir, whoever I am. Do you yield, sir, or shall I sweat for you? I think you are, Sir John Falstaff, and in that thought, yield me. I have a whole school of tongues in this belly of mine, and not a tongue of them sp speaks all but any word other than but my name. Here comes our general. <laughs> he just passed. Follow no further. Call in the powers, good cousin Messwilland. <laughs> now, full stop, where have you been all this while? When everything is ended, then you come. These tardy tricks of yours on my life, one time or another, will break some gallows back. I never knew yet, but rebuke and check was the reward of valour. Do you think me a swallow? an arrow or a bullet, I have speeded hither with the very extremest inch of possibility, and here, travel tainted as I am, in my pure and immaculate valour, have taken Sir John Colleville of the Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy. But what of that? He saw me and yielded, that I may justly say, with the hook-nosed fellow of Rome, their cousin, I came saw and overcame. It was more his courtesy than your deserving. Uh, I know not. Here he is, and here I yield him. And I beseech your grace, let it be booked with the rest of this day's deeds, or, by the Lord, I will have it in 
a particular ballad else with my own picture on the top of it, Colville kissing my foot. Therefore, let me have right and uh, yeah, let dessert mount. Thine's too heavy to mount. <laughs> let it shine then. Thine's too thick to shine. Let it do something, my good lord, that may do me good and call it what you will. Is thy name Colville? It is, my lord. A famous rebel art thou, Colville. Uh, and a famous true subject took him. I am, my lord, but as my betters are that led me hither, had they been ruled by me, you would have won them dearer than you have. I know not how they sold themselves, but thou, like a kind fellow, gavest thyself away gratis, and I thank thee for it. Now, have you left pursuit? Retreat is made and execution stayed. Send Colville with the Confederates to York to present execution. Blunt, lead him hence and see you guard in shore. Now, dispatch me towards the court, my lords. I hear my father is sore sick. Uh, my lord, I, I beseech you, give me leave to go through Gloucestershire, and when you come to court, stand my good lord in your good report. Fare you well, Falstaff. I, in my condition, shall better speak of you than you deserve. I would you had the wit. T'were better than your jokedom! <sighs> Good faith. This same young, sober-blooded boy doth not love me, nor a man cannot make him laugh. But that's no marvel. He drinks no wine. A good sherry sack had a twofold operation in it. Uh, mm, uh, it sends me into the brain, drives me there all foolish and dull and cruddy vapours, which environ it makes it apprehensive, quick, fortitive, full of nimble, fiery and delectable shapes, which delivered o'er to the voice the tongue which is the birth, becomes excellent wit. The second property of your excellent sherry is the warming of the blood, which before cold and settled left the liver white and pale, which is the badge of pusillanimity and cowardice, but the sherry warms it and makes it coarse from the inwards to the parts extremes. And then the vital commoners and inland petty spirits muster me all to their captain, the heart, who great and puffed up with this retinue doth any deed of courage. And this valour comes of sherries. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that skill in the weapon is nothing without the sack. Hereof comes it that Prince Harry is valiant, but the cold blood he did naturally inherit of his father he hath, like lean, sterile and bare land, manured, husbanded, and tilled with excellent endeavour of drinking good and good store of fertile sherry, that he has become very hot, and valiant. Mm. If I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them should be to forswear thin potations and to admit themselves to sap. Mm. Mm. <coughs> Are the, uh... <coughs> oh, how now, Bardo? Oh, the army's uh, discharged and uh, all gone. Oh, let them go. I'll go through Gloucester, and there will I visit Master Robert Shallow Esquire. I have him already tempering between my finger and thumb, and shortly will I seal with him. Come away! Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 4, Jerusalem Chamber in Westminster. Enter the King, carried in a chair. Warwick, Thomas Duke of Clarence, Humphrey of Gloucester, and others. Now, lords, if God doth give successful end to this debate, 
that bleedeth at our doors, we will our youth lead on to higher fields and draw no swords, but what are sanctified. Our navy is addressed, our power collected. <coughs> Only we want a little personal strength and pause us till these rebels now afoot come underneath the yoke of government. Humphrey, my son of Gloucester, where is the prince, your brother? I think he's gone to hunt, my lord, at Windsor. And how accompanied? I do not know, my lord. Is not his brother Thomas of Clarence with him? No, my good lord, he is in presence here. What would my lord and father? <sighs> Nothing but well to thee, Thomas of Clarence. How chance thou art not with the prince thy brother? He loves thee, and thou dost neglect him, Thomas. Thou hast a better place in his affection than all thy brothers. <laughs> Cherish it, my boy, and noble offices thou mayest effect of mediation after I am dead between his greatness and thy other brethren. Therefore omit him not, blunt not his love, nor lose the good advantage of his grace by seeming cold or careless of his will. For he is gracious, if he be observed, he hath a tear for pity and a hand open as day for melting charity. Yet notwithstanding, being incensed, he is flint as humorous as winter, and as sudden as flaws congealed in the spring of day. His temper, therefore, must be well observed. I shall observe him with all care and love. Why art thou not at Windsor with him, Thomas? Yeah, he is not there today. He dines in London. And how accompanied canst thou tell that? With points and other his continual followers. Most subject is the fattest soil to weeds, and he, the noble image of my youth, is overspread with them. Therefore, my grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape in forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. For when his headstrong riot hath no curb, when rage and hot blood are his counselors, when means and lavish manners meet together, oh, with what wings shall his affections fly towards fronting peril and opposed decay? My gracious lord, you look beyond him quite. The prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue, wherein, to gain the language, tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learnt, which once attained, your highness knows, comes to no further use but to be known and hated. So, like gross terms, the prince will in the perfectness of time cast off his followers and their memory shall as a pattern or a measure live by which his grace must meet the lives of others, turning past evils to advantages. Tis seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion. Who's here? Westmoreland. Health to my sovereign and new happiness added to that that I am to deliver. Prince John, your son, doth kiss your grace's hand. Mulberry, the bishop's group, Hastings, and all are brought to the correction of your law. There is not a new rebel sword unsheathed, but peace puts forth her olive everywhere. The manner how this action hath been born, here at more leisure may your highness read with every course in his particular. Oh, Westmoreland. Thou art a summer bird, which ever in the haunch of winter sings the lifting up of day. Look, here's more news. From enemies heaven, your majesty, and when they stand against you, may they fall as those that I am come to tell you of. The Earl Northumberland and the Lord Bardolph, with a great power of English and of Scots, and by the Sheriff of Yorkshire overthrown. The manner and true order of the fight, this packet, please it you, contains at large. <coughs> and wherefore should these good news make me sick? 
Will fortune never come with both hands full, but write her fair words still in foulest terms? She either gives a stomach and no food, such are the poor in health, or else a feast, and takes away the stomach, such are the rich that have abundance and enjoy it not. I should rejoice now at this happy news, and now my sight fails and my brain is giddy. Oh, me. Come near me now, I am much ill. Comfort, your majesty. Oh, my royal father. My sovereign lord, cheer up yourself. Look up. Be patient, princes. You do know these fits are with his highness very ordinary. Stand from him, give him air. He'll straight be well. No, no, he cannot long hold out these pangs. Speak lower, for the king recovers. This apoplexy will certain be his end. I pray you take me up and bear me hence into some other chamber. Softly, pray. The king is carried to one side of the stage and placed on a bed. Act 4, Scene 5, Westminster, Another Chamber. Let there be no noise made, my gentle friends, unless some dull and favourable hand will whisper music to my weary spirit. Uh, call for music in the other room. Set me the crown upon my pillow here. His eye is hollow and he changes much. Less noise, less noise. Who saw the Duke of Clarence? I'm here, brother, full of heaviness. Ah, oh, how now? Rain within doors and none abroad. <laughs> how doth the king? Exceeding ill. Well, heard he the good news yet? Tell it. He altered much upon the hearing it. If he be sick with joy, he'll recover without physic. Not so much noise, my lords. Sweet prince, speak low. The king, your father, is disposed to sleep. Let us withdraw into the other room. Will it please your grace to go along with us? No, I will sit and watch here by the king. Why doth the crown lie there upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? Oh, polished perturbation, golden care, that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now! Yet not so sound, and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow, with the homely nightcap bound, snores out the watch of night. Oh, majesty! When thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armour worn in heat of day that skulks with safety. By his gates of breath there lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire, that light and weightless down perforce must move. My gracious lord, my father! This sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many English kings. Thy due from me is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. My due from thee is this imperial crown, which as its immediate from thy place and blood derives itself to me. Lo, where it sits, which God shall guard and put the world's whole strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honour from me. This from thee will I to mine leave, as tis left to thee. Auric, Gloucester. Clarence. Doth the king call? Uh, what, would your majesty, how fares your grace? Why did you leave me here alone, my lords? 
we left the prince, my brother here, my liege, he who undertook to sit by and watch with you. The Prince of Wales? Where is he? Let me see him. Uh, the door is open. He has gone this way. He came not through the chamber where we stayed. Where is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. The prince hath taken it hence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep, my death? Find him, my lord of Warwick, chide him hither. This part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. See, sons, what things you are, how quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object. Now, where is he that will not stay so long till his friend sickness hath determined me? My lord, I found the prince in the next room, washing with kindly tears his gentle cheeks. He is coming hither. But wherefore did he take away the crown? Look. Where he comes, come hither to me, Harry. Depart the chamber, leave us here alone. I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was father, Harry, to that thought. I stay too long by thee, I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with my honours before thy hour be ripe? Oh, foolish youth, thou seek'st the greatness that will overwhelm thee. Thy life did manifest thou lovest me not, and thou wilt have me die assured of it. What canst thou not forbear me half an hour? Then get thee gone and dig my grave thyself and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees, for now a time is come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is crowned, up vanity, down royal state. All you sage counselors, hence, and to the English court, assemble now ruffians that will swear, drink, and dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways. Oh, my poor kingdom, sick with civil blows. When that my care could not withhold thy riots, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my liege, but for my tears, the most impediments unto my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke ere you with grief had spoke, and I had heard the course of it so far. There is your crown, and he that wears immortality, long guard it yours. Coming to look on you, Thinking you dead, and dead almost, my liege, to think you were, I spake unto this crown as having sense, and thus abraded it. The care on thee, depending, hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore thou best of gold, art worst of gold, doth eat thy bearer up. Thus, my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head to try with it, as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father, the quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the might of it, let God forever keep it from my head and make me as the poorest vassal that doth with awe and terror kneel to it. Oh. My son, God put it in thy mind to take it hence, that thou mightst win the more thy father's love, pleading so wisely in excuse of it. Come hither, Harry. Sit thou by my bed, and here I think the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son, 
by what bypass and indirect crooked ways I met this crown. And I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation. For all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. And now my death changes the mood. For what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. So thou the garland wearest successively. Yet, though thou standst more sure than I could do, Thou art not firm enough, since griefs are green, and all my friends, which thou must make thy friends, have but their stings and teeth newly ta'en out, by whose fell working I was first advanced, and by whose power I well might lodge a fear to be again displaced, which to avoid, I cut them off, and had a purpose now to lead out many to the Holy Land, lest rest and lying still might make them look too near unto my state. Therefore, my Harry, be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. That action, hence borne out, may waste the memory of the former days. <coughs> Lord, would I? But my lungs are wasted so that strength of speech is utterly denied me. How I came by the crown, oh God forgive, and grant it may with thee in true peace live. Oh, my gracious liege, you won it, wore it, kept it, gave it me. The plain and rust must my possession be, which I with more than with a common pain against all the world will rightfully remain. Look, look, here comes my John of Lancaster. Health, peace and happiness to my royal father. That brings me happiness and peace, son John, but health, alack, with youthful wings is flown from this bare, withered trunk. Upon thy sight my worldly business makes a period. Where is the Lord of Warwick? My Lord of Warwick! Doth any name particular belong unto the lodging where I first did swoon? Tis called Jerusalem, my noble lord. <laughs> Lord be to God, even there my life must end. It hath been prophesied to me many years I should not die, but in Jerusalem, which vainly I suppose the holy land. But bear me to that chamber. There I lie in that Jerusalem. Shall Harry die? Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 1, Gloucestershire, Shallow's House. Enter Shallow, Falstaff, and Bardolf with Page. By cock and pie, sir, you shall not away tonight. Davy, I say. You, you must excuse me, Master Robert Shallow. I will not excuse you. You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admitted. There is no excuse shall serve. You shall not be excused. Why, Davy? Here, sir. Oh, Davy, Davy, Davy. Let me see, Davy. Let me see. Let me see, Davy. Um, um, yea, Mary, uh, William Cook, um, bid him come hither. Sir John, you shall not be excused. Mary, sir, those precepts cannot be served. And again, sir, shall we sow the head and with wheat? With, with red wheat, Davy. But for William Cook, are there no young pigeons? Yes, sir. Here is now the Smith note for shoeing and plough iron. Oh, oh, let it be cast and paid. And Sir John, you shall not be excused. Some, some pigeons, Davy. A, 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 a couple of short-legged hens, a joint of mutton, and any pretty little tiny kickshaws. Let William Cook know. The man of war, say a sir. 
Uh, yay, Davy. I will use him well. A friend in the court is better than a penny in purse. Use his men well, Davy. They are arrant knaves and will backbite. I beseech you, sir, to countenance William Visor of Wancart against Clement Pope of the Hill. There is many complaints, Davy, against that visor. That visor is an arrant knave, on my knowledge. An honest man, sir, is able to speak for himself when a knave is not. I have served your worship truly, sir, this eight years. I cannot once or twice in a quarter bear out a knave against an honest man. I have little credit with your worship. The knave is mine honest friend, sir. Therefore, I beseech you, let him be countenance. Oh, go to, I say, he shall have no wrong. Look about, Davy. Uh, where are you, Sir John? Uh, come, come. Off with your boots. Uh, uh, give me your hand, Master Bardolf. I thank thee with all my heart, kind Master Bardolf. Welcome, my tall fellow. Come, Sir John. Uh, I'll follow you, good Master Robert Shallow. <laughs> uh, Bardolf, look to our horses. If I was sword into quantities, I should make four dozen of such bearded hermit staves as Master Shallow. It is a wonderful thing to see the semblable coherence of his men's spirits and his. They, by observing him, do bear themselves like a foolish justices. He, by conversing with them, is turned into a justice-like serving man. <laughs> it is certain that either wise bearing or ignorant carriage is caught as men take diseases one of another. Well, therefore, let men take heed of their company. Oh. I will devise matter enough out of this shallow to keep Prince Harry in continual laughter, the wearing out of six fashions. Oh, you shall see him laugh till his face be like a wet cloak ill laid up. <laughs> Sir John! I come, <laughs> Master Shallow. <laughs> I come, Master Shallow. Exit. Act 5, Scene 2. Westminster, a palace room. Enter Warwick, Lord Chief Justice, meeting. How do the king? Exceeding well. His cares are now all ended. I hope. Not dead. He's walked the way of nature, and to our purposes he lives no more. I would his majesty had called me with him. The service that I truly did his life have left me open to all injuries. Indeed, I think the young king loves you not. He do not, and I do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time which cannot look more hideously upon me than I have drawn it in my fantasy. Here come the heavy issue of dead Harry. Oh, that the living Harry had the temper of he, the worst of these three gentlemen. Oh God, I fear all will be overturned. Good morrow, cousin Warwick. Good morrow. Good morrow, cousin. We meet like men that had forgot to speak. We do remember, but our argument is all too heavy to admit much talk. Well, peace be with him that hath made us heavy. Peace be with us, lest we be heavier. Oh, good my lord, you have lost a friend indeed. And I dare swear you borrow not that face of seeming sorrow, it is sure your own. Though no man can be assured what grace to find, you stand in coldest expectation. I am the sorrier I would twear otherwise. 
Well, you must now speak Sir John's Falstaff fair, which swims against your stream of quality. Sweet princess, what I did, I did in honor, led by the impartial conduct of my soul. And never shall you see that I will beg erect and forceful remission. If truth and upright innocence fail me, I will to the king, my master that is dead, and tell him who has sent me after him. Here comes the prince. Good morrow, and God save your majesty. This new and gorgeous garment, majesty, sits not so easy on me as you think. Sorrow so royally in you appears that I will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart. Why then be sad, but entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured, I'll be your father and your brother too. Let me bear but your love, I'll bear your cares. Yet weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives, that shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness. We hope no otherwise, hope otherwise from, your from your majesty. You all look strangely on me, and you most, you are, I think, assured I loved you not. I'm assured, if I be measured rightly, your majesty had no justice cause to hate me. No? How am I to prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What rate, rebuke, and roughly sent to prison the immediate heir of England? Was this easy? May this be washed in levy and forgotten? I then did use the person of your father. The image of his power lay in me. And in the administration of this law, whilst I was busy for the Commonwealth, your highness pleased to forget my place and struck me in the very seat of judgment, whereon, as an offender to your father, I gave bold way to my authority and to commit you. If the deed were ill, be you contented, wearing now the garland, to have a son set your decrees at naught, to trip the cause of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person. Be now the father and propose the son. Hear your own dignity so much profaned. See your most dreadful laws so loosely slightened. Behold yourself so by a son disdained. And then imagine me taking your part and in your power soft silencing your son. After this consideration, sentence me. And as you are a key, speak in your state what I have done that misbecame my place, my person, or my liege sovereignty. You are right, Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore still bear the balance and the sword, and I do wish your honours may increase. Till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did. There is my hand. And princes all, believe me, I beseech you. My father is gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections, and with his spirit sadly I survive, to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies, and to raise out rotten opinion who hath writ me down after my seeming. The tidal of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now, now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our high court of parliament in which you, father, shall have foremost hand. Our coronation done, we will assite, as I before remembered, all our state and, God consigning to my good consents, no prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. <laughs> Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 3, Gloucestershire. 
Shallow's Orchard, and to Sir John Falstaff, Shallow, Silence, Davy, Bardolph, Page. Nay, ye shall see my orchard, where in an arbour we will eat a last year's pippin of mine own graffin, with a dish of calories and so forth. Come, cousin Silence, and make spent. For God, you have here goodly dwelling and rich. <laughs> oh, Baron, 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 beggars all, beggars all, such a marry. Good air. Mm. Spread, David, spread. Right. Oh, oh, well said, Davy. This. Davy serves you for good uses. He's your serving man and your husband. Uh, oh. Good for it. Very good for it, Sir John. Oh, by the man, I have drunk too much like at supper. A good holler. Oh, sit down. Sit down. Come, come, cousin. <laughs> ah, Sarah, quote that. We shall. Do nothing but eat and make good cheer. And praise God for the merry year. When flesh is cheap and females dear. And lusty lads roam here and there. So merrily and ever among so merrily. Oh, there's a merry heart. Good master silence. I'll give you a help for that. Oh, no. Give Master Bardolph some wine, Davy. Sweet sir, sit. I'll be with you anon. What you want in meat, we'll have in drink. <laughs> be merry, Master Bardolph, and my little soldier there. <gasps> be merry. Be merry, be merry, my wife has all. For women are shrews, both short and tall. Tis merry in hall when beards wags all. And welcome, merry shrove tide. Be merry, be merry. I did not think Master Silence had been a man of this metal. <clears throat> Why? I have been married twice or once, sir, now. A cup of wine, sir? A cup of wine that's brisk and fine. And drink unto the leman mine. And merry heart lives on. Well said, Master Silent. Mm. Oh, Spardolf, welcome. If thou wants. Anything and will not call, be sure thy heart. Welcome, my tiny little thief. Oh, and welcome indeed. Oh, oh, I'll drink to Master Bardolph and to all the caballeros about London. Oh. Ah. London once ere I die. And I might see you there, Davy. Oh, by the mass, you'll crack a quart together, will you not, Master Bardolph? Ah, yes, sir. In a bottle. Oh, by God's leggings, I thank thee. The knave will stick by thee, I can assure thee. I will not ask her. Tis true bread. And I'll stick by him, sir. Why, there, spoke a king. Whack, nothing, be merry. <laughs> Look who's at the door. Who knocks? Do me right and dub me tonight, Samingo. And to please your worship, there's one pistol come from the court with you. Uh, from the court, let him come in. How now, pistol? Uh, John, God save you. Uh, what wind blew you hither, pistol? Not the ill wind which flows no man to good. Sweet night. 
Thou art now one of the greatest men in this realm. Ah. Oh, dear lady, I think he's be but good man, Puff of Boston. Puff, puff is thy teeth, most recreant coward face. Sir John, I am thy pistol and thy friend, and elder skelter have I rode to thee, and tidings do I bring, and lucky doys, and golden times, and happy news of Christ. I pray thee, now deliver them like a man of this world. Give me pardon, sir. If, sir, you come with news from the court, I take it, but there's two ways. Either to utter them, or conceal them. I am, sir, under the king in the authority. Speak or die. Under King Harry? Harry the fourth or fifth? Harry the fourth? <laughs> A future for thine office, Sir John. Thy tender lampkin now is king. Harry the fifth's the man. I speak the truth. When pistol lies, do this and fig me like the bragging Spaniards. What, is the old king dead? As nail in door, things I speak are just. Away, bad off, saddle my horse. Master Robert Shallow, choose what office thou wilt in the land. Tis thine, the pistol. Oh, I will double charge thee with dignity. Oh, joyful day, I would not take a knighthood for my fortune. What, do I bring good news? Oh, carry Master Silence to bed, Master Shallow, my Lord Shallow. Be what thou wilt, I am Fortune Steward. Get on thy boots, we'll ride all night. Oh, sweet pistol. <laughs> <laughs> Away, Bardolf! Come, pistol, utter more to me, and withal devise something to thyself. Good. Uh, boot! Yes. Uh, boot! Uh, yeah. Master Shallow, I know the young king is sick for me. Let us take any man's horses. The laws of England are at my commandment. Oh, blessed are they that have been my friends. And woe to my Lord Chief Justice. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 4, London, a street. Enter Beadle with Hostess Quickly and Doll Tearsheet. No, thou arrant knave, I would to God that I might die, that I might have thee hanged. Ow! Thou hast drawn my shoulder out of joint. Oh. The constables have delivered her over to me, and she shall have whipping cheer, I warrant her. There hath been a man or two killed about her. Nuttock! Nuttock, you lie! Come on, I'll tell thee what, thou damned trite visaged rascal, and the child I go with do miscarry. Thou want better thou had struck thy mother, thou paper-faced villain. If it do, you shall have a dozen cushions again. You have but eleven now. Come, I charge you both, go with me, for the man is dead that you and Pistol beat amongst you. Oh, the Lord that Sir John will come, he would make this a bloody day to somebody. I'll tell you what, you thin man in a censer. I will have you soundly swinged for this, you blue bottle rogue, you filthy famished correctioner. Come, come, you see knight errant, come. Oh God, that right thus overcome might. Well of sufferance comes ease. Come, you rogue, come, bring me to a justice. Exeunt, Act 5, Scene 5, Westminster, near the Abbey. The King and... ...his train pass over the stage. After them, enter Falstaff, Shallow, Pistol, Bardolph and the Boy Page. Stand here by me, Master Shallow. 
I will make the king do you grace. I will leer upon him as he comes by, and, and do but mark the countenance that he will give me. God bless thy lungs, good knight. Come, here, pistol, stand behind me. Oh, if I had had time to have made new liveries, I would have bestowed the thousand pound I borrowed of you. But tis no matter. This poor show doth better. This doth infer the zeal I had to see him. It does so. It shows my earnestness of affection. It does so. My devotion. It does, it does, it does. As it were, to ride day and night, not to deliberate, not to remember, not to have patience to, to shift me. It is best certain. But to stand, stained with travel and, and, and sweating with desire to see him, thinking of nothing else, putting all the fares else in oblivion as if there were nothing else to be done but to see him. It is all in every part. So indeed. My knight, I will inflame thy noble liver and make thee rage. Thy doll and Helen of thy noble thoughts is in base, durance and contagious prison. Howled thither by most mechanical and dirty hounds. Rouse up revenge for doll is in. Pistol speaks naught but truth. I will deliver her. God save thy great king the, the royal owl. The heavens thee guard and keep most royal imp of fame. God save thee, my sweet boy. My Lord Chief Justice, speak to that vain man. Have you your wits? Know you what tis you speak? My king, my Jove, I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man, fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs becomes a fool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old and so profane, but being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body, hence and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. No, the grave doth gape for thee, thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with a full-born jest. Presume not the thing that I was, for God doth know, so shall the world perceive that I have turned away from my former self. So will I that kept me company. When thou dost hear I am as I have been, approach me and thou shalt be as thou wast, the tutor and feeder of my riots. Till then, I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders not to come near our person by ten mile. For competence of life, I will allow you that lack of means enforce you not to evils, and as we hear, you do reform yourselves. We will, according to your strengths and qualities, give you advancement. Be it your charge, my lord, to see performed the tenure of my word. Set on. Master Shallow, I owe you a thousand pounds. Yea, marry Sir John, which, which I beseech you to let me have home with me. That can hardly be, Master Shallow. I, do not you grieve at this. I shall be sent for in private to him. Look you, he must seem thus to the world. Fear not your advancements, I will be the man yet that shall make you great. I, I cannot perceive how, and unless you give me your doublet and stuff me out with straw. I, I beseech you, good Sir John, let me have 500 of my thousands. Uh, uh, sir, I will be as good as my word. This that you heard was but a colour. Uh, a colour that I fear you will die in, Sir John. Fear! No colours! <laughs> Go with me to dinner. Come, Lieutenant Pistol, come, Bardolph. I shall be sent for soon at night. Go carry Sir John Farsdorf to the fleet. Take all his company along with him. <laughs> my lord, <laughs> my lord, I... <laughs> I cannot now speak. I will hear you soon. Take them away. 
E fortuna mi tormento, sperato mi contento. I like this fair proceedings of the kings. He hath intent his wanted followers shall all be very well provided for, but all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. And so they are. The king hath called his parliament, my lord. He hath. I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard a bird so sing, whose music to my thinking pleased the king. Come, shall we hence? Exeunt. Epilogue. First, my fear. Then my curtsy. Last, my speech. My fear is your displeasure, my curtsy, my duty, and my speech to beg your pardons. If my tongue cannot entreat you to acquit me, will you command me to use my legs? And yet that were but light payment to dance out of your debt. <laughs> but a good conscience will make any possible satisfaction. And so would I. All the gentlewomen here have forgiven me. If the gentlemen will not, then the gentlemen do not agree with the gentlewomen, <laughs> which was never seen in such an assembly. One word more, I beseech you. If you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it and make you merry with fair Catherine of France, where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of a sweat, <laughs> unless already he be killed with your hard opinions. For Oldcastle died a martyr. And this is not the man. My tongue is weary. When my legs are too, I will bid you good night. Ladies and gentlemen, is our show for this evening. Please give yourselves a massive round of applause. Well done, everyone. Incredible work, incredible work. Thank you so much for that. Really, really enjoyed it. And wow, what a moving ending there. So, so good. Thank you all so much. I'm slightly out of breath here, but I'm gonna try and introduce you all. Uh, and hopefully that will give me a chance to catch up. So, first of all, as always, our incredible producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm an actor and innovation project manager based in Glasgow. Our associate director, stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hi, my name's Emily. I'm a director, writer and stage manager based in Edinburgh in Scotland. And on music and sound, it's Adam Woodhams. Hi, I'm Adam Woodhams, a can-can specialist based in the southwest of England. <laughs> giving it the absolute beans mate we love it and our cast for tonight put together by the incredible casting director Sydney Aldridge here they are as King Henry IV Elizabeth Dennehy I am Elizabeth I live in Los Angeles I'm an actor and educator as Prince Henry Tanvi Virmani hello I'm an actor in training based in Reading as Sir John Falstaff Stephen Leesk Hi, I'm Stephen. Uh, I'm an actor living just outside of London. As Archbishop of York, Fergus Rattigan. Hello, I'm Fergus. I'm an actor and actor combatant based in London. Earl of Westmoreland, Candice Handy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Candice Handy. I'm an actor in Cincinnati, Ohio. Prince John of Lancaster, Stephanie Stevens. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie, actor, writer, singer based in Crawley, West Sussex. As Northumberland, Jamie Richard Stewart. 
Hi, Jamie from Edinburgh. As Lord Chief Justice Nerissa Mahaha. Hi, everyone. I'm Nerissa. I'm an actress in training based in South Africa. As Lord Bardolf, Kurt Himmelberger. I am Kurt Himmelberger. I'm an actor from Philadelphia, United States. As Shallow, it's Elizabeth Lancaster. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a part-time university lecturer in uh, sunny Yorkshire. <laughs> As Morton and others, Tom Vanton. Uh, hi, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm a teacher and actor when the Wi-Fi works and I'm based on the west coast of Scotland. As Earl of Warwick, Avion Apcadno. I'm Avion Apcadno and I'm an actor based in Wales. As Pistol, Christopher Padden. Hi, I'm Christopher Padden. I'm an active combatant based in Edinburgh. As Lord Hastings, Lin Lindsay Hubner. Hello, my name is Lindsay. I'm an actor based in London, UK. As Lord Mowbray, James Drake. Hi, I'm James. I'm an actor based in London. Mistress Quickly, Lucy Ailey Parker. Hello, I'm Lucy. I'm an actor, director, writer based in West London. As Lady Percy, Lynn Favin. Hi, I'm Lynn Faven. I'm an actress from America based in England. As rumor, Nikki Olpress. Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm a director and writer and android living in Reading. <laughs> As silence, Robert Doust. Hi, I'm Robert. I am an actor and I live in London. As Bardolf, John D. Houston. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> There he is. <laughs> and I'm an actor based in Canada. And our ensemble for this evening, starting with Jenny Rowe. Hello, I'm Jen Rowe. I'm an improviser and actor, and I'm based in Brighton. Jack Lancaster. Hi, I'm an actor, and I'm based in Chicago. David Martinez. Hi, I'm David, and I'm a, an actor and ecologist based in Kansas City, US. Quinn Hendel. I'm Quinn Hendel. I am an actor and soon to be high school freshman in uh, Minnesota. Blue Kirkby. Hello, I'm Blue. I'm an actor, director and Shakespeare nut from London. Jenny Wills. Hi, I'm Jenny Wills and I'm an actor based in London, not a Shakespeare nut. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Nowakowski. Hi, I'm Tyler. I'm an actor based in Massachusetts. Jeannie Kaminsky. Hi, my name is Jeannie Kaminsky. I'm an actor and producer based in London. And Patrick Hugh. Hi, I'm Patrick McHugh. Uh, I'm an actor musician based in London. <laughs> and Patrick and Jeannie, as I'm sure you noticed this evening, were our valiant swings and val valiantly indeed did they swing in to keep the story moving forward. Thank you so much to both of you. Tremendous job there. And arguably, probably uh, our earliest ever deployment of a swing into the run of a show there. So really well done, Patrick. Uh, you were clearly on tenter hooks that whole time. So that's fantastic. Um, Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, if you have any questions for us, do please uh, send them in and we will ask them to our cast and crew. Uh, so yes, just let us know what you would like to know and we will be very happy to answer your questions. Of course, in the meantime, I do have an exclusive for you, which is that I spoke to Lucy in the backstage chat while the show was going on and she confirmed that she's going to give us a reading of that very moving uh, Mistress Quickly speech, uh, which is going to be a Patreon ex exclusive. So if you're interested in becoming a patron, you can find the details of our Patreon page uh, in the YouTube description. You can donate uh, very little per month. <laughs> I think it's £1.30 is the minimum that you can give. Uh, so there's no reason not to. Uh, so if you are in a position to be able to do so, all of your contributions are incredibly, incredibly uh, what's the, what I've lost my thread. Um, invaluable, that's the word that I'm looking for. Wonderful, sorry, I've just been shouting into the screen for the past three minutes. I think I've gone slightly lightheaded. Wonderful, marvelous. Sarah, do we have any questions from our audience yet or is it still all applause? It's, yeah, it, it's just been wrapping up the applause. <laughs> so we'll give it a, a couple more minutes for questions to come through. Of course, um, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jeremy, there was a point of clarification that we wanted to put across as well, wasn't there? There, there was indeed, yes. I, I'm terribly sorry. I got my poins and my pistol 
confused. Poins, uh, sadly, has left the show and does not return. Poins is um, one of my favourite characters. I think he's really great. Um, uh, but of course, Pistol does return and so does Bardolf. But we won't give any spoilers as to what happens to them in H5. Yes, but absolutely. I got that wrong. <laughs> Uh, and there was an interesting fan theory that I saw in the chat uh, as it was coming up. Do you think Paige in this play is boy in Henry V? Well, I think that might be a possibility. I think Paige is a great character. And it's just so touching when we learn that Falstaff himself was Paige to Mowbray, the character who opens Richard II. I think there probably is a whole PhD thesis to be written on pages, the sequence of pages in uh, Shakespeare's work. The turning of the pages, absolutely. I kind of see a cat in the background there as well, Jeremy, saying yes, hello. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful, yes, wonderful. Yeah. Our audience go. loves the pets. They love the pets. That's actually another bit of our Patreon exclusive uh, content, I think, isn't it, Sarah? You'll get a ga gallery of the, uh, the pets of Show Must Go Online. It might just be, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful. Actually, I have got a question here um, for, for the cast, and this is probably more so the case actually for our alumni cast members. Um, but someone in the audience has asked, uh, do you um, ever watch the playback and see the groundling comments? And if so, do you mind the chat? <laughs> um, I'll answer that. No, I haven't watched the feedback. <laughs> um, I, did, <laughs> I just go with the live thing and then kind of just step away. Uh, I've watched the playback, but I fast forward to my part. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you for your honesty, Candice. That is absolutely right. In the world, in the uh, in the post world, uh, post COVID world, I insist that all of my praise comes in the form of emojis. So I always look at the emojis, and that's how I get my kicks now. <laughs> Absolutely, and the emojis are flooding in. Oh, we've got a cat alert, Patrick. Oh, Just to answer we might be able to get double cats. That, no, I can't get the other people cat. Con lots of people confessing to, to watching it back and reading oh, all the comments. We love them. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I speak for everyone. We say we love the groundling comments. It's great. It lets us know that you've been watching, that you've been enjoying. We can see all the bits that you've really enthused about. I love watching the comments on all the other shows as well. It's, it's, it's brilliant to see how enthused people get about it. Absolutely. The groundlings doing as groundlings do, you know, live and boisterous. Nikki, Ralph is here. Um, just to continue the chat about the groundlings comment, um, as theatre makers, it's really useful for us to be able to look at really honest and enthusiastic feedback. It's good for the egos, but it's also good for us um, to be able to hone our craft and go, oh, that's how that moment landed. Oh, actually, we were going for that with that moment. That's what people have taken away from it. It's such a valuable resource for us as performers and theatre makers. So, Groundlings, thank you so, so much for your comments. We really value them. Absolutely. It doubles as instant market research, which is wonderful, you know, and in, in a medium like this, uh, obviously you get it a little bit in comedy nowadays uh, because people still laugh out loud, uh, but in like dramas and tragedies and things like that, it can often be difficult to gauge how the audience has taken things. So, you know, there were some really um, poignant moments uh, in this play uh, and it was actually lovely to be able to see uh, the comments rolling in during those times and the fact that those moments were landing you know that uh, amazing scene between uh, the father and son uh, Henry the fourth and Henry the fifth and then the rejection of Falstaff in particular you know really uh, extraordinary moments there and, and peppered all the way through was that foreshadowing that things were starting to darken, things were starting to turn. And I thought you all pitched that really lovely. So thank you so much, everyone. Really, really great job. Really great job. Wonderful, Sarah, have we waffled enough? <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully. Um, <laughs> I've got a question actually relating uh, to that scene. So someone has asked, um, do the actors think Hal genuinely thinks that Falstaff could reform um, or does he know he won't? Um, and is that why he's so upset at their parting? I think uh, I think Hal does think that. I think he's the kind of person, especially when he becomes king, where he sees the he tries to be in touch with everyone and sees the good in everyone as much as possible. Um, and I think he does think that Falstaff will change. He doesn't know when, which is probably also where the emotion comes in. He doesn't know when he's going to see Falstaff again. He knows he will, but he doesn't know when. Um, uh, yeah, so I think he does know. 
Yeah, I think that's lovely. I think also, obviously, Hal has his own reformation, doesn't he? So in order yeah. for that to be real, uh, it must be, other people must be capable of it, right? Exactly. If he can do it, then Falstaff can as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think I'd just like to uh, offer a, a large round of applause to Tanvi for a portrayal of Hal today as well. Really, really amazing work, mate. So good. Thank so you. good. <laughs> so, so good. Thank you so much for that. Wonderful. Uh, Sarah, any more questions? Yes. So I have one here um, that starts with, you have such a talented and diverse cast. Yay. Absolutely. Um, you are all amazing. Uh, so the question is, how do you get the cast together and watch or do all those auditions? <laughs> well, somewhat uniquely for uh, theatre, especially, we don't audition. Uh, we ask people to give submissions of interest where they can uh, share details. So they can either send us what's called a spotlight page, which is kind of like an actor's CV. Sometimes it comes with video clips. Um, but often we'll uh, just look at the information that people send. Uh, we offer people the opportunity to select what character they might be interested in playing. Obviously, in the majority of cases, uh, we have to cast around that. But Often, uh, but sometimes that does happen as well. I think there's a couple in tonight's cast that specifically requested the roles that they ended up playing. Um, and so uh, really we take a lot of chances on this show, we really do. And it's something that uh, I think has uh, really paid off uh, because I think often with Shakespeare in particular, uh, it can be difficult to find an open door to come and give it a crack. Uh, and that's something that we've always been uh, really uh, kind of has, has been really important to us and something that we've always wanted to do. And it's uh, chiefly credit to Sydney Aldridge, our casting director, that every single week she goes through hundreds of submissions uh, in order to put uh, fresh casts together week in and week out. Uh, and, you know, even now, of course, we're starting to see alumni faces uh, co uh, coming in and uh, becoming a part of the show. But we nevertheless have uh, plenty of new faces coming in every week as well, even now in week, what, 17, is it? Um, and so, we, you know, we've said it's more than 300 actors now that we've worked with, um, which is uh, an extraordinary number of people to uh, get introduced to as well. So it's, it's a delight for me as a director to be able to meet and work with so many actors, so many people from different places that have different training, different contexts, different ways of talking about Shakespeare. Um, so it's a really enriching process for me, too. Could I say something here? Please. Because I'm an um, amateur actor and I think you take the biggest risk of all with someone like me where you haven't got like this fancy CV and click on here and go to that thing, oh, flipping heck, how they go. So thank you very much for, you know, and I would encourage anybody who's listening to this, who thinks they, they without a, a professional CV to, to demonstrate, just to, you know, nag a bit and eventually <laughs> they, might, they might give you a shot. So thank you very much. I can't Absolutely, believe mate. You're, you're, I was learning from you. You're amazing. Exactly well, that. I think that's, that's hugely generous. Thank you very much. No, no Elizabeth, seriously, seriously, you knocked it out of the park. It was a great portrayal of a great role. I had so much fun working with you, so much fun watching you. And for me, if there's one thing that I hope that we can achieve through this process, it's, um, it's getting rid of those glass ceilings that might exist between different types of acting, if you like, or different uh, sources of enthusiasm for acting. Uh, I started off as an amateur. Um, I'm sure many actors that have gone pro started out in uh, amateur theatre. Um, and for me, uh, some so there's been amazing performances, not just tonight, uh, but every week that uh, some of our amateur actors have turned in. So, uh, yeah, absolutely for me, I think it needs to be... Uh, put behind us the idea that there's any kind of stratification between the two because ultimately uh, amateur actors professional actors ultimately we all do it because we love it and that's and what I, we all have in common it's true Robert. i want to add to that it just means not paid yeah <laughs> to be Absolutely. honest yeah 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 um, candice i just wanted to add to that that that's what i've always loved about the show like before like i first got on it like I was such a super fan and like I don't know about um the UK or wherever everybody is but like in America we're having serious conversations about um the like sort of the culture of theater and how it's not inclusive and how it's become this sort of club and it's like you know well you're not smart enough to like be here or or whatever and i i love that it's so inclusive and and i learned so much from 
like working with all these from everybody is great. Thank you so much, mate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hard second. <laughs> Wonderful. Sarah, any more questions? Yes. Uh, so I've got one here, um, which is, uh, what are Hal's brothers thinking in the scene where um, uh, where he comes on as king? <laughs> no one wants to take it. I'm realizing, yeah, that's um, all of us. Um, I just recommend that you watch Succession. I think that's that's uh, really <laughs> yeah. 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 I have a feeling none of us want to be bossed around by our own brother. Um, I think I'm there's a fear as well. Yeah. Yeah, we put. I mean, we put up with something for for such a long time with his behavior, and then for it to sort of change on a dime, it's it's like surprise and excitement at the potential, but also a very cautious approach to, okay, he's making these promises, we shall see. Mm. And we all work so hard to sit where he's uh, seated. Like we're all wearing suits and, and um, we want to suck up to our father so, so bad, but uh, we, we don't get that because we're young. <laughs> you know? So Stephanie, I think maybe Prince John is is the kind of second son, it seems to me, is the kind of closest to him uh, in terms of, yes. I guess, fame. Uh, so what, what was going on with Prince John uh, having, you know, single-handedly put down the rebellion earlier on? Um, I feel like Prince John is that dutiful son. His father's sick. He can't let anybody else in. And you have Hal, who is in the tavern drinking, um, canoodling, gallivanting, whatever, and I'm here doing all, all the hard work, all the plotting, all the scheming, and then he becomes king. And I think there's a part of John who is, you know, let's, okay, this is, this is, okay, we've stopped the rebels, but then it's like, can he actually live up, can he live up to this? He, he's in that speech where he's saying, you know, um, we're, 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 we're all together, we're grieving all together, and it's like, okay, um, okay. <laughs> We'll see, we'll see. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of watching you. I'm, I've got my eye on you. Yeah, absolutely. Probationary period almost. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Uh, there's something as well, I think, Elizabeth, that we talked about actually earlier today, because that's how these rehearsal periods work. <laughs> uh, but we were talking about um, the perception of King Henry and, and almost the kind of analogue in his mind when he fears that Hal has kind of stolen the crown covetously and, and for all the kind of wrong reasons. Uh, there was an analogy there to uh, American politics. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was talking to Rob about my sons grew up with only Obama as president and they were like, in 2016, how is this possible? How did this happen? And it's so much worse than we ever could have possibly imagined where tens of thousands of people are dying. And uh, I think that we were, what we were talking about is that if Hal with his ruffians take over the court, that's what I'm foreseeing at that moment. Yeah, the, the kind of the dread and the stakes of that dread comes from the idea of, yeah, uh, you know, ideologues just coming in and, uh, and running it roughshod for their own personal gain, right? And uh, they, yeah, they seeing the consequences. On uncurbed, uncurbed hedonism and just going rampant wild yeah yeah absolutely absolutely wonderful Sarah any more questions uh, yes so I've got one here uh, which is for those actors taking on a role that was previously seen in Henry IV part one did you look at the last show for ideas or inspiration or did you kind of dive in blind uh, and, and have a fresh take on it I don't know how anyone else uh, did it, but personally, uh, I I would I didn't watch anyone else's version uh, because I think every, each of these productions, even though you're playing the same character, should always feel like a different production, unless unless everyone is cast all the way through, because I think then uh, each individual production has its own unique life and body to it. And I think that's important. Um, I went to college though with Jack Baldwin, who was full staff in part one. So I can imagine what, and I've, <laughs> and I've seen him do some of the speeches before. So I am, um, I sort of know that uh, how 
good he is. So <laughs> I was, uh, so I sort of had a bit of John in the back of my head just because I've I've known him for about uh, eighteen years. Wow! 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 That's so I, cool. I didn't. Uh, although I've seen all the shows, uh, when it came to this, I just that was just gone. I approached quickly, like, is she is here? Yeah, yeah. Where what? I mean, apart from my own, where was she? I didn't go. I didn't refer back at all. Yeah, and it's one of those things that we had a d debate about: was uh, are we going to, uh, you know, cast the same people to play the same parts all the way through, or are we going to do three different takes? And with the decision to do three different takes, that it was what Steve was kind of talking about, um, and what Lucy kind of proved, which is that um, there are multiple valid ways to interpret a character, and with a character as uh, famous or infamous as Falstaff, uh, and a character as uh, kind of epic as Hal and his arc. Um, you want to, I, I wanted us to see different uh, interpretations of that because I think that's part of the joy of a project like this where uh, rather than uh, kind of, you know, there are pluses and minuses, right? So like in a TV show, you, you uh, establish a relationship with that actor as much as you do with the character that they're playing. And then that kind of enriches your experience of the arc in one hand. But on the other hand, uh, with something like this, where we're always looking to work with as many new people as possible, uh, it felt right to, to see these different takes. And I'm really glad that we went that way because the, the take were really different I felt. I think the only, um, I, I didn't look back at it either um, uh, purely because I wanted to do my own original take but looking back now I think the only reason for me to look back and see Henry the fourth part one was for mine and Falstaff's relationship because we we're, we barely have any scenes together in this one so what what you know it'd be nice to have you know, base it off something. And in that respect, yeah, I, I kind of would have liked to look back on it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. The cool thing about this play is that they, you, there's such a, a love and relationship created in that first, more so than a battle or anything. That's what's, that's like a love story, that part of it. And it's, it's, it's so strange that there is two, only like two times they, they meet in this and it's, it just feels like, I feel a lot of it, I feel like they're both a little bit lost and out of place, but when they come together, it doesn't feel the same anymore. Uh, you know, like going out with a terrible ex. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, 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 it is weird. It's weird to know that you, my whole drive for the whole play, uh, I barely have any interaction with. It's just, yeah, strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, to me, it's, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because it's that uh, same instinct that Shallow has of reliving the glory days. And it feels to me like that's what Hal's trying to do as well. You know, Hal's killed Hotspur. He's taken on this mantle. The expectation that he was trying to defy has now been placed firmly on his shoulders. And what does he do? He, go, he goes back. Uh, and even though he goes back and he tries to relive it, it's not the same anymore. And uh, I think that's part of that, that bittersweetness, that poignancy that this play has, that autumnal feel, as Jeremy so beautifully put it. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Sarah, any more questions? Uh, yes, I've got a couple here. So um, one was a question just generally about rehearsals and, and how we do them. Um, and how do we talk about Shakespeare and the language? Um, and sort of, yeah, how do we navigate through that? I'll open that one out to the floor. <laughs> um, I can go for this one. I've been an actor for a while, but this is my first Shakespeare show. So, and I got about a, um, we only have like four days of rehearsals. You can meet with your fellow scene partners, but I got like one hour with Rob. So I read it, I read my lines the first time and Rob was like, great, that's the speed. Now read it like the words, you know what the words mean. So then I read it like I know what the words mean. And Rob's like, great. And now internalize your, feelings about the scene, which I hope I did. So that was my quick and dirty uh, introduction to Shakespeare in the rehearsal process. So thank you, Rob. No worries, right? no worries, absolutely. Um, a, a key tip, pro tip, if you're interested, is uh, hit the verbs. That's, that's one of the things I'll talk about is verbs and the words that are on the end of verse lines, if you've got verse uh, speech. If you hit the verbs in the line and the word on the end of the line, nine times out of 10, you're, you're, you're doing it right. <laughs> For, for those of us outside the UK, rehearsals are early. <laughs> they are, they, I don't think I've ever actually had to get up at five in the morning to rehearse. Totally worth it. I'd do it again on a heartbeat, but that was a new one on me. 
<laughs> Absolutely, man. We thank you so much for that as well. It was great to have oh, you there. Like you said, I think any of us uh, would, would would do it again. It's just, and you know, it's interesting coming into the rehearsal room at that hour, and everyone else is like, "Oh, hi, it's middle of the day. You know, we've just come back from lunch." You're like, "Uh huh," and and you get that even through this very uh, odd medium. You don't think you would you would get the kind of connection you can with other actors, but it's absolutely terrific. And uh, and I found myself occasionally forgetting that, oh, I can't actually literally just pass this over to someone, or I or um, or someone says, oh, I need such and such thing. Oh, that's okay, I'll bring it. Now. Oh no, that's not going to do you any good. I'm <laughs> I'm five thousand miles away from you. Um, so that that was certainly a very interesting and different part of the process for me. The other thing for me personally is most of my <clears throat> years in the theater, and we're not going to mention the number. Um, I work by myself. I usually do solo stuff. So I can't remember the last, well, I guess the last time I did Shakespeare would have been the last time I worked on a cast this size. And that's always really interesting. And in many cases, not really seeing these people, like I don't interact with the court. So seeing the court scenes today was, oh, oh, wow, I've never seen this person before. Wow. <laughs> that was also, you know, it was, it was, it was as much a surprise for me, as I think, as it was for the audience in many cases and a delightful one. Oh, wonderful. Thanks so much, John. That was lovely. Uh, final question, and we're going to wrap up with this one, and it's one for Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, now we've done a few of them. Uh, how are you finding uh, seeing the histories in particular performed on Zoom? Well, I think it's just it's interesting, just what John was saying just now, that, that, that actually Zoom is brilliant for these large cast plays, and that notion of people just meeting each other on the stage, you know, for the first time, um, is absolutely brilliant. And uh, I really love the histories because they've got so much going for them. You know, there's so much action and then there's intimate relationships and then there's drinking <laughs> and there's a lot of comedy <laughs> in there. You know, what's not to like really? But um, so I think, it's, I think it's been great, but you, following Shakespeare's plays and the order in which he wrote them is an, a wonderful journey because you kind of get inside his head. I mean, not it's a, it's a weird and extraordinary place to be, but you kind of, you think, oh yeah, of course he used that last time and now he's using it again and he's doing something slightly different with, with it. So I can't wait for next, for it's, it's much ado next, isn't it? Much ado about nothing next week, yeah. Because yeah. you, there you've got, you know, people coming back from a war or going to a war, um, but you've actually got the the family relationships and the, the soldiers, so it's it is it's a it's a logical step on from this play, I think. Absolutely, thank you so much for that, Jeremy, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, watching at home for sticking with us till the bitter end. We much appreciate it. As you heard just there, we are going to be doing much ado about nothing next week, so please tune in same time, same place for much ado about nothing. That's all for tonight. Thank you all so much. We have to wave. Um, sorry. Great.